Hi, I'm Charles with Anicap. This is my recap for the anime Shangri-La Frontier. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. The story begins as we see that a half-naked masked man just defeated a monster. A creepy girl that probably had a few too many energy drinks watches nearby and celebrates that the Dark Lord was defeated. The luchador-looking guy proudly watches as the beast vanishes and the sun emerges from behind the clouds. His name is Sunraku and the weird girl once again praises the warrior. She points out how it's been a long hard journey and Sunraku couldn't agree more. Sunraku then surprisingly takes to the sky and exclaims that it's time for Faria to go with the Dark Lord. He then does her a huge favor by rearranging her hideous face with his foot and tells her that she is the real menace in this world. We see that Sunraku was actually in a game. He proudly proclaims that he finally beat it and also managed to get revenge for everything that Gargoyle put him through. In this world, display-based games are considered retro and fully immersive VR games have become the norm. Beneath the small number of works of significance lies a massive pile of releases whose game's designs don't live up to their improved graphics technology. These games are known as trash games. Although most people rightfully despise trash games, there are those who gleefully seek them out, and these people are called freaks. Our protagonist named Rokuro is one of these freaks, and he proclaims that rumors were true and the game he just played was a giant pile of garbage. Rokuro compares the feeling he gets from beating a trash game to how a convict feels when finishing up a prison sentence. This psycho then wonders what trash game he will try next, and we learn that he is known as the Trash Game Hunter. When he heads downstairs, we learn that his mom is kind of a weirdo too, as Rokuro tells her that one of her butterflies got out. At school, some random girl stalks Rokuro and practices what she plans to say to him. She decides to ask about video games and waits for the perfect moment, but some other kid beats her to it. At a game shop, the owner named Mana hopes that summer vacation will help bring her more business. Rokuro's stalker named Rei arrives at the shop. Mana knows exactly why she is there, but tells Rei that Rokuro isn't there today. Rei is too shy to admit to it, but Mana points out how nice it must be to be young and in love. Mana explains that Rokuro has been busy trying to crack an extra special trash game, so he hasn't been there in a while. She shows her the game called Feria Chronicle Online and states that it's a legendary trash game. All the allies in the game have terrible AI, enemy attack patterns don't make any sense, and there are an absurd number of bugs in the code. The game is also extremely hard. Serious skills are needed even just to beat the first boss so it has caused tons of players to rage out of control throwing their headsets like lunatic degenerates. On top of all that, she has also heard that players have to fight the final boss in board shorts and a mask. Just then, Rokuro arrives looking for any new trash games that might have come out. He makes his way to the counter and we learn that Rei is an absolute coward as she instantly disappears. Mane is shocked to see him there and Rokuro proudly announces that he beat Feria Chronicle online. Rei watches from around the corner like the stalker she is and hears Rokuro explain that the game was a spectacular pile of garbage. The worst part about it was the female lead Feria. She's the cause of pretty much every problem he ran into on the journey. She makes every situation worse and gets villagers and party members killed. She also never suffered any consequences for anything since she would always find a way to blame it all on the last boss. Even though the boss didn't do anything and she was a problem all along. Rokuro continues to trash the trash game as he explains that if he ever gave Feria even the tiniest little shove to vent his annoyance, she would just get upset. She would not go with him anywhere and refuse to move the story along. The autosave would lock him into the state of affairs and it would take 3 hours to get back in the psycho's good graces. Mon is surprised that he didn't just give up which makes sense since he would be able to get an actual life but he explains that that's how they get you. In the 3 minutes between beating the final boss and before the credits start rolling, you can beat the snot out of the crazy girl without fear of retaliation. Rokuro points out the irony since the more fairy annoys you, the more determined you become to brave all the garbage to experience the 3 minutes of heaven. This guy clearly takes trash games way too seriously as he states that when that moment of bliss finally comes, it's as if all his frustrations are wiped away. In that moment, he felt like he understood why he was put on this earth. For some reason, Rei is smiling like a creep while hearing this and Rokuro explains that the trash game was too good. Now he can't think of what to follow it up with. Mana comes up with the absurd idea to not play a trash game for once. 
She explains that experiencing the lows in life can help appreciate the highs, but the reverse is also true. Mana then introduces him to the game Stronger La Frontier, the fully immersive VR game with over 30 million players. She continues to convince him and gives Ray a not so subtle wink for some reason. She explains that it can be fun to try things designed for mass appeal now and then, and Rokuro seems to give it some serious thought. Back home, we find that Rokuro's dedication to his gaming experience reaches dangerously high nerd levels as he studies the history of the game. He finds that Shangri-La Frontier, aka SLF, won on the market less than a year ago, and it set a Guinness World Record for simultaneous player logins. The concept is, a colony fleet that came from space died out, but not before leaving a new society behind. Thousands of years later, the PCs are living their lives at roughly medieval tech levels. This piques his interest as it's a setup that allows for effortless inclusion of sci-fi elements. Rokuro seems to be getting convinced, since unlike Feria, which is so bad that haters find themselves desperately searching for redeeming features, this game is so beloved that its few haters are completely drowned out by tens of thousands of fans. Rokuro puts down his gamer fuel and decides to try the game out. We then learn a bit about the company that made the game called Utopia Entertainment Software. It was founded by the genius programmer Tsukoyo Tsukuri, who developed a fully immersive VR game system. It's a leader in the fields of software development, hardware, and internet service provision. Rokuro puts on his virtual reality headset and wonders how long it's been since he played something that wasn't trash. The game begins with character creation and Rokuro is amazed by how many options there are for classes. He chooses a twin blade mercenary for its flexibility and then moves on to origin. He reads that wanderers build defense slowly but get bonuses to luck. Luck affects critical chance and item drop rate so he decides to go with that. Things begin to get really exciting when he finds how many options there are to character customization as it allows him to even change race and body type. He makes some really strange noises as he gets a bit too excited and he reminds himself to calm down. Rokuro realizes that he has been so poisoned by trash games that he is now getting blown away by silly small stuff. Seemingly forgetting about what he just said, Rokuro excitedly states that it's time to go hardcore on character design for the first time in forever. We then surprisingly see that his finished character design looks a bit strange, but it at least saves us the pain of having to look at his ugly face. He is not to be mistaken as a half-naked furry since he actually has a very good reason for doing this. We learn that his playstyle consists of ignoring armor in favor of getting the best weapons possible. These weapons are costly of course, but in SLF, amazingly, you're given the option to sell your starter equipment during character creation, and you can make quite a profit. Rokuro thankfully wanted to hide his face, and the only option was the dumb looking bird mask. He had no choice as it would be pretty awkward for him to play half naked if everyone could see his face. Rokuro is the type of player who uses the same name in every game he plays, so he inputs the name Sunraku. He lays down on his bed and finally enters the game. Rokuro skips right past the prologue because who actually cares and arrives in the world of the god tier game to find one of his kind. It flies away and Rokuro is immediately impressed since moving around feels pretty much like real life. He tests everything by running and climbing through the area and points out how much better everything feels compared to the game with the disgustingly hideous girl in it. Rokuro marvels at how large the world is and pulls out a map. He wonders why he didn't start out in a tutorial town for beginners like most games, and doesn't realize that those who choose Wanderer as their origin start out at a random point in the beginners area. He decides to head to the starting town but once again admires how good the controls feel. He checks his stats and acknowledges that his low defense is because of his half nakedness, but hopes that his high luck stat will make up for it. Just then he is surprised to be attacked so soon as he encounters a goblin. Rokuro refuses to be a half-naked coward and decides that it's time to see what the game's combat engine is made of. The brave little goblin initiates the fight, but probably regrets all his life decisions as Rokuro uses a powerful attack to slice him in half. Rokuro impresses himself, but acknowledges that that goblin was just a scrub enemy in the intro. It does level him up though and he sees that its axe can be dual wielded. Something moves in some bushes nearby, and Rokuro thinks about how there's a lot to learn in the game, like monster weaknesses, patterns, and item drops. He states that whether it's a trash game or god tier game, everyone gets the feeling he's getting now. The elation of diving headfirst into a new world. It's something that can't be found in real life. 
His enemy finally emerges from the bushes and just barely misses his attack on Rokuro. The attack was extremely powerful and he acknowledges that it would have put him down if it hit him. The terrifying bunny goes in for another attack but this time Rokuro blocks it and he counters while landing a critical hit. Bugs Bunny with rabies is far too determined though and continues attacking. Rokuro is disappointed with what this game has to offer and we see that he has pierced the bunny. He explains that the bunny just kept going for his neck so it was far too easy to figure out how to counter it. He is glad to see that he has leveled up even more but disappointed to not see the rabbit sword as loot. Just then his stat screen reveals that he has met a certain condition and learned the skill flash counter. Apparently he can unlock skills by taking certain actions so Rokuro takes a moment to appreciate how well designed the game is. He realizes that since a player's own skill supplements their dodges and parries, he can fight pretty well against even higher level enemies. This makes him want to try a bunch of different fighting styles. His appreciation doesn't stop there though as Rokuro realizes that he has been playing this entire time without encountering a single bug. We then watch all the previous bugs he had to deal with such as the hitbox bug, the clipping bug, and the infamous invisibility bug. He expresses excitement as he wasn't sure if he could enjoy a bug free game after all this time, but is sure now that he can really have a good time with it. Rokuro heads out in search of another rabies bunny but stops for a moment to completely destroy an ogre. He levels up again and decides that he should probably allocate his stat points. He wishes that the Vorpal Bunny would spawn more often but realizes that it must be a rare enemy. He still managed to kill 50 of them and get his sweet looking dual swords. He also learned some new skills but states that only one of them is worth using. Rokuro decides to move forward though since he's not going to gain any more levels with the scrub tier monsters around there. He has strayed too far away from the starter town but sees that he's close to another town aptly named Secondville. He makes his way there but sees that a snake with ponytails is blocking a bridge. Rokuro is relieved to finally have a real challenge and prepares to fight the stylish serpent. Don't let the poor hair design fool you, this beast is actually very powerful as it is the area boss that is meant to be fought by a party. Rokuro takes a moment to think about all the attacks a snake usually has in games. He states that with an avatar that actually moves the way he wants it to, he doesn't need defenses to beat the boss and he charges forward. He demands that the game give him something exciting and we see that Rokuro is enjoying himself quite a bit. At the exit of a nearby town several people look at something in amazement. Their jaws drop and we see that it's someone wearing gigantic armor. This is the starting town Firstia. The townspeople see that this person has high level equipment and a crest from an achievement focused clan. The clueless bunch wonder what someone like that is doing there and we can tell by the voice that it's a girl. She checks all the names of the people in front of her and reminds herself that Rokuro gives all his characters the same name. He isn't there though which is strange since all starting players come to Firstia. Back in real life we see that Rokuro's stalker knows no bounds as it was her looking for him in the game. Back with our pigeon faced hero he begins his attack on the snake with hair so mesmerizing it's as if it was stolen from an angel. Rokuro decides to watch its patterns and dodges a few of its attacks. The genius gamer determines that it's still a boss for beginners. Its movements are easy to read and it won't have any insta kill moves. The glass cannon realizes that he can beat this thing without taking a hit, since even one hit would kill him anyway. Rokuro masterfully dodges another attack but his weapon shatters. He knew its durability was getting low but can't believe it just broke on the first hit. He sees that Princess Ponytails has tough scales and decides that it's time to try out his sweet blood blades. Rokuro goes in for an attack while quipping that he's going to make snake fillets but is surprised by some purple stuff spewed out by the ponytailed python. His first thought is that it might be poop but a display reveals that it's poison and he will take damage every 10 seconds. Featherface realizes that he might have underestimated the snake and its beautiful flowing head of hair. Our god of trash games tells the snake that he has beaten trash games with mechanics way cheaper than this and a little poop flinging won't be enough to get him down. Rokuro thinks about how the poison deals him 1 damage every 10 seconds which means he has about 4 minutes left so he will need a reliable way to land criticals if he wants to beat it. Our birdman uses his bird brain to determine that criticals in this game don't trigger at random. They seem to trigger when an attack is landed in an ideal way or when an enemy is hit in their weak point. However the snake isn't just fashionable its body is covered in super tough scales so he concludes that its weak point has to be its head. The snake super protective of its stylish hair blocks his attack making Rokuro realize that landing an attack on its head won't be easy. 
Instead, he decides to make his own weak point and uses the move Screw Pierce to pierce its body. He continues to attack the hole he made, and this absolute god gamer states that the defensive properties of a wounded section change, allowing criticals to trigger there. The snake dramatically screams in pain, with his beautiful head of hair flowing through the wind like it's in a shampoo commercial. Rakuro hacks away as his time is running out, but he has no clue how much HP the snake has and isn't sure if he will make it. He is pushed back and Rakuro now realizes that beating trash games online made him pretty cocky. When he initially entered this mass appeal game for casuals, this cocky peacock thought that he would be able to no-hit things easily and wouldn't have to use recovery items. He was just being arrogant though and the snake consumes him. Rakuro isn't done yet and uses his flash counter move. Rakuro takes the upper hand by grabbing onto a lock of its hair that is so beautiful it rivals that of a unicorn's tail. One last piercing screw to its face causes its head to explode and we say goodbye to the hair salon loving serpent. Rakuro couldn't be happier as he levels up after defeating the old poop snake. His loot is good enough to fetch a good price but he notices that his health is still dropping. He has no time to distribute his attribution points and just dumps it all into stamina and agility. The bird starts to fly back to town to buy an antidote, but realizes he doesn't know where the shops are, and is certain he won't make it in time. He can't even register his respawn point since he doesn't know where the inns are yet, but he has no choice but to run as fast as he can like he's on a wild goose chase. At the town we see that a guy named Yamamoto is ecstatic that after 3 whole months of trying, he finally got the girl he's crushing on to start playing SLF with him. Her name is Maya. This Romeo has maneuvered himself into the role of the advice giving veteran and won't let this chance pass him by. Unfortunately, his intimate encounter is interrupted by our raging lunatic and Maya thinks that it's a monster. Yamamoto points out that it has a name so it must be a player. This crazy girl thinks she should kill it anyway but Yamamoto points out that killing other players puts a skull in front of your name. The murderous psychopath considers it but decides against it and they wonder if the bird got hit with the poison poop. Yamamoto tells him where the inn is but explains that the respawn point will only register once he gets in bed. At the inn, the receptionist is talking way too calmly as she points out all the amenities they have to offer, so our frantic hero rushes her. Rakuro finally makes it to his bed to register his respawn point but the poison hasn't been cured and he dies. Rakuro returns to reality where he is disappointed to have died but glad he didn't lose any items. He decides that he will have to thank the guy that helped him but for now just appreciates how awesome the game SLF is. Our god of trash games eventually arrives in Secondia in search of necessities like a map and recovery items. The bird thinks he should buy a powerful main weapon to help him reach his goal of hitting the top player ranks, but soon realizes that perverts are staring at him for being half naked and he makes the right decision by going to get clothes first. He just gets the cheapest clothes he can buy since it's only to keep people from looking at him weird, but then strangely decides that his bird head is less weird looking than a mask. At a weapon shop, Rakuro doesn't like what it has to offer, and the weapon store guy points out that Rakuro's bunny daggers are actually very rare. Rakuro becomes excited however when the man explains that he can make him weapons, but he would have to get the materials. Our little pigeon wastes no time and instantly heads to an area with plenty of ore. However, he gets his feathers all flustered as he just ends up mining stone after stone. He is frustrated since he has been swinging his pickaxe for at least 30 minutes, but only has two of the six pieces of ore he needs. As if he didn't have enough to worry about with all the mud and a heavy pickaxe, an annoying frog appears to do what frogs do. This poor frog messed with the wrong bird. This little frog swims in the mud like it thinks it's swimming in the Olympics and it has its innocent little heart set on first place. Rakuro thought they could coexist since it wasn't that dangerous, but determines that the frog clearly wants to be turned into materials. His attack knocks the innocent little frog back so he goes in to finish it off. He knows that the frog has slash resistance since his suit is made from its skin and decides that he can only use bludgeon and piercing attacks. His axe is perfect for this but his feathers get all ruffled again when he realizes that the marsh's mud slows down a player's movement significantly. The poor little frog meets its demise at the hand of our beak faced hero but it was so easy for him that it didn't even cheer him up. Rakuro notices that more new players have been showing up lately because of summer break and determines that he must beat everyone to the race for materials. Afterwards, Rakuro amazes the shop owner with all his ore. He is told that one of the pieces is really special and has two blades made from it. After some time, they are ready and he finds out that they are god tier weapons. This very helpful blacksmith states that doing something called raising a weapon is very important. 
Raising turns out to just mean upgrading, but it's the term used by blacksmiths that take their job way too seriously and think of the weapons they make as their children. All Rakuro can think about is how the blacksmith is an NPC, but its speech and mannerisms are amazing. The NPC tells him not to leave town in armor like he has while it's dark, since nocturnal animals are dangerous. Little does he know, our crazy bird friend is up to the challenge and plans to use those dangerous nocturnal animals to break in his new weapons and pile on some more levels. Back at the bridge, we see that the snake has risen from the ashes like a phoenix with its hair more dazzling than a thousand suns. Unfortunately, it is met by a powerful attack from Rei, who continues her search for Akuro. This stalker detective searched the entire beginner's area for him, but determines that he must have defeated the snake without stopping by town, and is now in Secondale. She wonders if a new player could really accomplish such a thing, but is confident that if anyone could, it would be Rakuro. Elsewhere, our battle-loving birdie fights Golem from the Lord of the Rings, and he goes over everything he has learned. First, monster spawns change based on if it's day or night. Most nocturnal monsters are as aggressive and dangerous as the weapon seller said. That has helped him to make progress leveling up and to learn some new skills. However, this particular little beast seems a little too powerful. This one's movement and attacks are on a whole other level from the forest goblins. It's got lots of HP and incorporates feints into its fighting style like it's been doing it all its life, like it's fighting for Frodo's ring. Just then, the little goblin lets out a crazy sounding battle cry and calls all its little goblin buddies. As if fighting one wasn't bad enough, now he has to face several, and he determines that he would have to run at full speed just to have a chance of getting away. However, just then, Rikuro snaps himself out of that mentality and reminds himself that he is enjoying himself far too much to just run away. Rikuro may be a bird, but he is no chicken and takes on the challenge. As he defeats the annoying little goblins, Rikuro thinks about how he has just been having a lot of fun this entire time and telling himself that god tier games are pretty neat. However, this game has much more to offer. It is in this very moment, as a gigantic ferocious monster appears, that Rikuro encountered the true Shangri-La frontier. Rikuro can't believe his eyes as he learns that it's a unique monster, and he braces himself for the fight of his life. Elsewhere, we get a glimpse into Rei's room as she is in-game. This crazy stalker is looking for Rikuro and questions Yamamoto who claims to have seen Birdface. The bloodthirsty psycho he has a crush on wants to end Rei because she apparently thinks everything is a monster, but Yamamoto reminds her not to end other players. Yamamoto explains that Big Bird went to Secondale after getting a face full of poison from the python. It was clearly him since no other player is crazy enough to wear a bird head while half naked, but Yamamoto points out that he could have changed his equipment by now. Rei is in disbelief at how Rokuro beat the ravenous python without visiting the first town. Rei leaves the two snitches with a parting gift called the coordinate teleporter and blasts off. It turns out that they didn't even know Rei, but Yamamoto can tell from the emblem on her cape that she is from a clan focused on a specific unique monster, like a gun the Night Slayer. Unique monsters are a special class of monsters with both an individual name and a title. Most monsters when beaten or captured respond as a new individual after a set period of time passes, but for the unique monsters there's only one of each in the entire world. Rumor says that there's seven of them in SLF, but the spawn criteria for most of them are unknown. For each of these unique monsters called Colossi, lots of top players have formed clans focused on taking them down. These Colossi are very rare, but the real issue is how abnormally strong they are. It's been an entire year since the game started, but even with a player base of over 30 million, not one person has managed to defeat a single unique monster. Back with Rokuro, we see that he has encountered one of these impossibly strong Colossi. He learns that it's the unique monster like a Gonda Night Slayer. Rokuro thinks about how the little goblins he was fighting earlier were pretty tough, but this unique monster blew them away with just one attack. All he can do is stare at the ferocious beast as he is certain that getting hit by just one of its attacks will end his life. The giant wolf thing isn't satisfied with just standing there though and initiates its attack. Rokuro saves himself for a moment with a block, but his attempt at a counterattack fails. Just seconds in, Rokuro's already feeling the effects of the tough battle, but he still decides to taunt it by telling the beast that unique monsters like him don't have much going for them. Deep down though, our glass cannon knows just how close he was to seeing an end screen. He is glad that he spent all night grinding, since if he hadn't learned Perfect Parry, he would be a virtual reality ghost right now. Perfect Parry allows him to avoid an enemy's physical attack if executed with exact timing. The beast continues its relentless attack, and Rokuro once again just narrowly avoids it. He knows that he needs to go all out just to give himself a chance at winning, and goes in for an attack of his own. 
Rekuro switches to his Vorpal Choppers he got from the Rabies Rabbit and combines it with a movement ability to land a critical strike. The beast is hardly affected and continues to bombard Rekuro with attacks. The fight pauses for a moment just as the Night Slayer disappears. It reappears to land a few more attacks only to disappear again moments later when the moon is covered by clouds. It sneaks up on him once more but Rekuro shows that he can more than handle his own against it. The monster seems to be teleporting as it attacks Rekuro from behind but Rekuro shows his skill as a gamer when he times his parry perfectly to just barely save his glass cannon self from getting blown up. The beast reappears before Rekuro but he's clearly having fun as he lets out a chuckle. The fight continues as the beast continues to disappear and reappear. Rekuro manages to land another strike but exclaims that its pelt is even tougher than the ponytailed python scales. Rekuro has been wailing on the thing for over 5 minutes without taking a hit but the unique monster is just too tough. Rekuro has landed hundreds of critical strikes but he isn't even sure if he's doing any damage. His vorpal choppers which started out close to mint condition are already falling apart. Rokura is certain that if he doesn't find a softer spot to land a hit on, his weapons are going to fall apart. He acknowledges that this beast is way out of the league of what he's able to fight at this stage, but that's exactly the way he likes it. And that's what makes Shangri-La Frontier a god tier game. Our intense protagonist could not be having a better time as he describes the spine tingling intensity that makes him feel like he's on fire. As he lands several more critical strikes, he states that it's not possible to enjoy a game more. He is a gamer who has made it through a countless number of trash games, filled with bugs and garbage balance. Since he knows that this beast doesn't have a bugged out hitbox like in the other games, there's no chance he will give up now. Rekuro lands yet another powerful attack but this one doesn't do much either. He gets pushed back outside of the beast's range but it lets out a loud roar that paralyzes Rekuro. The moon is hidden again allowing the beast to disappear and Rekuro seconds later is shocked to see that his legs are gone. Rokuro has no clue what just happened but acknowledges that getting hit by reality really hurts. As he lies there in defeat, he points out that harsh reality. He is not going to suddenly learn an awesome new skill or get saved by a run-in from some mysterious high level player. Nothing cinematic like that is going to happen. He realizes that that isn't completely true as somehow after a hit like that, he still has one health point left. And that has to be a miracle. He compliments the unique monster for being absurdly strong but points out that that absurdity was intentionally coded into him. The beast is exactly as strong as its creators wanted it to be. This means that it's beatable absurdity. It's in this very moment that Rekuro has made his decision. He no longer cares about the game's final boss or even the story. It might not be in this moment but someday he vows that he will beat the unique monster. Rekuro speaks directly to Lycagon the Night Slayer and tells it to make sure that no one else beats it before he does. The ferocious monster finishes him off and we see that a curse called Lycagon's Mark has been applied. Moments later, Rekuro responds back in Secondale and finds out that this curse doesn't allow equipment to be equipped to the body part afflicted by the curse. A quick check of his body reveals that he's almost completely covered in the Lycagon's Mark, meaning he cannot equip stuff to his torso and legs. Rekuro vents his frustrations for a moment as he condemns the disappearing wolf for doing this to him. This proves to be the curse that just keeps on giving as there is plenty more. Monsters of a lower level than the afflicted character will flee. Conversations with NPCs will be affected by the presence of like a gun's mark. And the afflicted body part gains a resistance to magic effects. The only way the curse can be removed is through the prayers of a saint or the defeat of the curse's caster. Because of all this bad news, Rekuro decides to get some fresh air before he ends himself. There he lets out a loud scream as he exclaims that this is the kind of broken curse that happens in trash games. As people wonder what the half-naked weirdo is doing, Rekuro calms himself. He then reminds himself of the three principles he learned from all the trash games. Patient mind, unbreakable spirit, and a cool-headed judgment. A quick check of his stats actually reveals that players rack up a lot of experience from just fighting a unique monster. Which means he leveled up quite a bit, buffed up his skills, and got lots of stat points to allocate. After he allocates his points, he quickly comes to the realization that he made himself a glass cannon who will die in one hit. He had no choice though since he can't even use 2 out of 4 of his armor slots. Spending points on vitality is like peeing in the ocean and the same goes for his HP. Not only that but his best stat is 65 in luck. He thinks that is probably why he was just able to survive for a moment with just that 1 HP. He prays that his luck has to be good for something and hopes that it's okay to turn to luck for help. Just then, a very well-dressed bunny falls on his head. It looks a bit different than bunnies he's seen before and he wonders if this game allows monsters to spawn in towns. 
The dapper little furball takes off, so Rokuro goes after it. He is convinced that by the way it is dressed, he will get a rare item if he catches it. Just when it seems like he is about to catch the little guy, it creates a door and the drink gives our protagonist a smug look as he gets away. Rokuro reads a message on the door that says it's a unique scenario, an invitation from Rabbituza. Rokuro remembers reading about this on the Game Guide site, and explains that SLF has a sweeping main story about the exploration of the world, but it's also got a huge number of side quests. One subset of these is called Unique Scenarios, mystery scenarios whose unlock times, locations, contents, and flags aren't publicly known. So the equipment, skills, and spells you can acquire in these unique scenarios are said to all be top class. Rokuro opens the door and thinks about how it's not unusual to see clan searching desperately to find these unique scenarios. He lets out a laugh since encountering one this early in his playthrough is amazing. He determines that it must be the result of dumping his stat points into luck, and promises not to let this chance slip away. Well after he enters the door though, we see that the level requirement is 80, and Rokuro's only level 28. Once inside, he is shocked to find that it's a world full of bunnies and their beloved carrots. He fears he might have walked into a monster's lair and is welcomed by the little jerk that taunted him into coming. This bunny wanted to meet Rokuro badly and explains that all of Rabbituza is a buzz about him. This is because despite his great personal weakness, Rokuro had the courage to attempt the Night Slayer all on his own, and because he had the skills to continue striking perfect deadly blows without taking a single hit. To them, Rokuro is the embodiment of the Vorpal Rabbit soul. Rokuro is freaked out by the little guy's enthusiasm, and the bunny says he wants to be just like Rokuro. Our humble hero is quick to point out that he barely left a scratch on the unique monster, but the bunny explains that's only because it's so powerful. He calls it the Night Emperor and explains that it's a colossus, capable of gobbling down wyverns like a midday snack. The fact that Rokuro is even there speaking to him now suggests Rokuro is under the divinity's protection. What's even more amazing to the suited furball is that the marks covering Rokuro's body prove that the Night Emperor regards him not as mere prey, but as a fellow being. Rokuro can't help but wonder if something's wrong with the rabbit's brain, and remembers that one of the traits of the mark was that conversations with NPCs would be affected. The bunny explains that his bunny boss would like to meet him, but our skeptical birdman wonders if this is some kind of revenge trap for all the bunny's lives he's ended. The bunny kind of just ignores his question and introduces himself as Emil. Emil eventually answers and assures Rokuro that his boss is far above petty matters like revenge. At Rabatuza Palace, our new friend explains that while many humans visit Rabatuza on a regular basis, Rokuro will be the first to enter the palace. This is quite shocking, but Rokuro becomes excited as this must mean that this is a unique scenario that only he knows about. Rokuro explains that he was pretty worried after getting all marked up by that unique dog, but it looks like his luck is already turning around. Emil takes him to his father slash boss, and Rokuro is shocked by the powerful presence of this guy. He acknowledges Rokuro as the guy that got beat up and peed on by the unique monster that he calls a puppy. He explains that humans lose their vorpal soul so quickly, so he assumed that they were all hopeless. However, he has now determined that one of them has promise, and shocks Rokuro when he asks for some of his time. This gigantic rabbit introduces himself as the rabbit boss of Rabbituza, named Visach. Back at the game shop, Mana catches Ray, the stalker extraordinaire, on the prowl for her not-so-secret crush Rokuro. Ray tries to deny it, but the game shop owner isn't stupid, and explains that it's summer vacation, so he's probably in Shangri-La Frontier. Ray admits that she hasn't been able to find her prey in-game, because he skipped the first tutorial city entirely. Mana laughs as charting his own course is classic Rokuro, and a typical trash game fanatic move. She explains that Rokuro will do things normal players won't do, and run into all kinds of outrageous unique scenarios. Mana encourages the little stalker to step up her stalking game, but surprises her when she tells Rei to admit her feelings to him. In the next scene, we meet Rumi Hizutome as she's about to begin her storyline, but she leaves and we don't see her again. Meanwhile, Rokuro is reading about the trigger conditions for the Tour of Rabatuza unique scenario. He learns that if you defeat a monster of a higher level than you with Vorpal weapons equipped, a special Vorpal bunny will appear in any town and invite you to Rabatuza. Once you arrive, if you defeat the Lagonian Python, a monster terrorizing their city, you'll learn the Enchant Vorpal spell. The beginning part was right, but Rokuro explains that the rest of his unique scenario that happened the day before was nothing like that. He definitely didn't end up wrestling any pythons. Instead, it was the intimidating Yakuza boss looking bunny, the sort of cuddly terror you would expect if the mob started recruiting in petting zoos. A look back shows that Visach complimented Rokuro on his fight against the puppy. 
He admires Rakuro's Vorpal soul, but Rakuro can't help but be intimidated and wonders what in the world is a Vorpal soul. The Yakuza bunny then makes him an offer he can't refuse, the offer to get him up to snuff. Rakuro's pretty confused at first, but then realizes that this must be a training quest and unique scenario training could yield amazing buffs. He quickly accepts the offer but almost gets himself whacked when he calls Vysatch Anaki as it made him very angry. Rokuro explains that it was just a little joke, but the giant bug's bunny on steroids doesn't say a word. Luckily for Rokuro, Vysatch has a sense of humor as he doesn't call a hit on him and lets out a big laugh instead. He acknowledges Rokuro as his underling and asks him to call him Vash. This is a privilege only given to those with potential, and Rokuro accepts as he thinks about how he is glad that the Tsukuza bunny didn't have him swimming with the fishes. Vash tells the more than excited Emil that he will leave Rokuro in his hands, which of course the weird little bunny loves and he promises to work super hard. Emil is excited to take Sunraku-san on a tour of the palace, but Rokuro explains that he needs a break after a long playing session. But in his head, he thinks about how he also wants to look up more about unique scenarios and unique monsters. Rokuro is glad to hear that he can register his respawn point there and Emil offers to take care of it. Vash remembers that he forgot one thing and puts a Vorpal Soul Collar on Rokuro. Rokuro is shocked to find that the Collar gains 2.5 times the stat points when leveling up, but will only receive half the experience. He instantly tries to take it off, but Vash explains that it's no use. He won't allow Rokuro to take it off since extraordinary hardship is necessary for the weak to grow strong. He then reminds Rokuro to never forget the Vorpal Soul. The goofy little bunny tells him that it looks great on him, but Rokuro just can't believe that he has been saddled with another restriction. Back to the present, Rokuro acknowledges that even if it does have his experience, getting 2.5 times the stat points is a pretty big upside. It might even be a broken cheat code. No one on the forum seems to know about Vysatch or Emil, let alone the Vorpal Soul Caller. No one's even found a unique scenario where you enter the palace of Rebetuza. Rokuro then gets super hyped as he realizes how amazing it is to have found a unique scenario only he knows about. Unfortunately, he has an appointment with someone named Katsu and loads up a game he hasn't logged into in forever. It's called Berserk Online Passion, or as some people call it, Burp. It's a fighting game Rokuro once got deeply into, and naturally this means that it's a trash game. Its player base has waned to less than 100 sign-ins per day, leaving many to wonder why the server is still running. This means that most of those who remain playing the game know each other. They are all of a single kind, trash game enthusiasts. Rokuro meets with Katsu and asks for the rules of the fight. The fight begins though as Katsu does his best impression of Luffy without a straw hat and reminds Rokuro that anything goes. Katsu shows him his new move he worked out while Rokuro was focused on Falia Online that he calls NSFW Tentacle Attack. Rokuro is surprised to see that Tatsu developed a new glitch and wonders how a madman like him got to be a pro gamer. Katsu is shocked since he is using a delay, but Rokuro is still somehow managing to block his attack. Katsu calls Rokuro the real madman for having such fast reaction speed, and Rokuro points out that his quick draw fist is the ultimate fighting style. He explains that as long as he has 12 frames, he can even counter boss instacle attacks unscathed. The two continue their fight that looks like something right out of One Piece and people around begin to take notice. Though Burp is considered a trash game, their fight perfectly demonstrates the reason for Burp's niche appeal. And that is that any bug goes. Their Gatling gun punching continues and Rokuro celebrates when he breaks off one of Katsu's fists. Unfortunately, this ends up being bad for him as that fist ends up ending the fight. Rokuro can't believe that the after image fist textures were part of the hitbox and he has announced the loser. Still, Rokuro thanks Katsu as he has only been fighting NPCs recently and needed a good PvP. Katsu hoped that Rokuro was telling a bad joke when he learned that he was playing SLF, but Rokuro takes no shame in admitting that he is actually really into it. His little friend still doesn't understand, so Rokuro explains that SLF has crazy strong monsters called the Seven Colossi. They are so rare that the entire player base has only managed to get the names of four of them. No one has ever beaten a single one of them since the game started. Rokuro reveals that he fought one of these beasts and it wasted him. With that, Katsu is convinced and he decides that he might have to give SLF a try. Hearing Rokuro talk about it has piqued his interest and he admits that none of his IRL friends play Burp anyway. That is in all as a certain person also plays SLF and Katsu sent this person a message to tell them that Rokuro was playing it too. Rokuro has no clue who this person is but we see that it's some purple haired girl. 
This chick is fighting a bunch of guys when she received the message and states that she always thought Rokuro had some kind of condition where he would die if he ever stopped playing trash games. She finishes up all her opponents and we see that she has the player kill badge for ending all those real players. She seems glad that Rokuro is playing SLF and decides that she will have to oh so gently guide him through it. Rokuro returns to Secondale and thinks about how handy Emil is for being able to use a teleport gate. He feels pretty good and wonders if coming from playing Burp is the reason that his SLF avatar is so easy to move in. Emo wonders why Rakuro wanted to leave so soon since there is so much to do in Rabbituza. Rakuro explains that while he really wants to explore Rabbituza, getting to Third Rima before the crowds start pouring in is more important. There has been a huge uptick in players since summer break started. The forums report that the Star Town Firstia is packed to the guilds with new players. Segondia won't be far behind which means there are going to be log jams at facilities and fights over monsters and mining spots. Also, Third Rima is a pretty big city, so if he's going to go all out in the Rabbituza unique scenario, then he would like to do it from a big city with plenty of breathing room. Emil completely agrees, but Rokuro is shocked to hear that Emil hilariously didn't understand a single thing. Emil is still more than glad to help and Rokuro is shocked to find that he can add NPCs in his party. Emil explains that Rokuro can't reach Rabatuza or the palace without him, but Rokuro thought that the little furry NPC would just be tagging along. Rokuro accepts Emil's party request and finds that the little bunny has higher stats than he does. He isn't too concerned about it though since he is confident that he will pass Emil in no time. Rokuro is pretty sure that the Lycagon's mark is the trigger for that unique scenario and wonders if Emil is the game's way of making up for it. The two prepare to head out but are stopped by two girls who think that the talking little bunny is adorable. They want to know if they can get it as a pet too but are shocked to realize that Rokuro is a half-naked bird pervert. Rokuro realizes that he was so distracted that he didn't stop to think about how Emo is an NPC attached to a never before seen unique scenario. Since he has it all to himself for now, he would like to keep it a secret at least until he can clear it. The dumb little bunny introduces himself and tries to chat it up with the ladies. However, Rokuro stops him and yells out that it was just his ventriloquism act as he runs away. Unfortunately for him, one of the nosy girls takes a picture of them and decides that they will have to ask the forums where to get one of the talking bunnies. The two get away from all the crowds and Emil admits to not being the high level athlete he looks like as he is not so well suited for all the running around. Emil eagerly awaits their next task and Rokuro explains that he wants to confirm something. He wants to test a part of his curse that says that monsters of a lower level than the afflicted character will flee. Luckily for them, a lower leveled monster appears to attack them and it runs away as soon as it sees the curse. This is perfect as Rokuro chases after it like some kind of bird cheetah hybrid. Our brilliant gamer doesn't just pursue it mindlessly though as he has a plan to chase it into an obstacle. With perfect timing, Rokuro throws his weapon as soon as it changes direction. With it stopped, Rokuro attacks it with the fastest speed he can muster. Rokuro points out that he received an attack bonus from Inertia, a law of physics taken for granted in the real world, and very few games actually try to replicate it. He admires how this game models reality as close as it can, and Emil arrives to celebrate with intense energy as always. He admires Rokuro's fighting skills as he could hardly tell which one was the monster. With Rokuro's test complete, he has decided what needs to be done now. The plan is to ignore all the scrubs and head straight to the area boss. Emo marvels at the planned simplicity and the two take off excited to take on whatever the future holds. Unfortunately, just seconds later, we see that Rokuro is extremely frustrated. They have arrived at the area where the boss should be but there's only swamp as far as the eye can see. The little rabbit is just worried about his sweet looking clothes and Rokuro thinks about what Emo told him on the way there. Emil explained that the area boss is a monster named Mud Digger. It rockets out of the ground to attack, so it's crucial to find a way to hold it in place. Rakuro realizes that he has to fight this Mud Digger in a swamp, and that means he might be in big trouble. Just then, Emil senses the beast, and Rakuro has Emil get on his shoulder. It's incredibly difficult to move in the swamp, so they just barely manage to move out of the way as a giant monster emerges. We learn that a characteristic of Shangri La Frontiers is that its swamp terrain forces a walking state. This means that one leg always remains trapped in the marsh until the other foot reaches the bottom. This ferocious beast is clearly very powerful as the recommended party size for fighting it is 4. Rokuro realizes that he might have made a huge mistake as this is the worst matchup possible. The ferocious beast is strangely able to dive into the shallow swamp which is only possible because of game logic and Emo freaks out fearing that they will be skinned alive. However, Rokuro smoothly uses his slide move to narrowly avoid death. 
He acknowledges that figuring out how to use the skills that evolved after fighting the Lycagon is the key to this battle. His evolution of the move Perfect Parry is the Repel Counter, which allows him to instantly counterattack after timing his parry perfectly. Emil is impressed, but Rukuro isn't satisfied since he is pretty much just evading damage. Both skills he just used have 10 second recast times, and he has no other way to avoid damage in the meantime. The beast gives him no breaks, but luckily his little bunny friend comes in clutch with an impressive attack. Emil explains that it was just a bit of magic, and Rukuro realizes that he has been so focused on soloing this game that he completely forgot he had a partner this time. Rukuro knows he can't waste this opportunity, so he uses an ability that grants a temporary bonus to attack power and agility. Unfortunately, trying to move quickly in the swamp sucks big time. The beast recovers, but this gives Rukuro the opportunity to use the evolution of his screw pierce attack called Spiral Edge. Another ability gets them in a more advantageous position, and Rukuro does a balancing act only possible because of his experience in trash games that have terrible platforming. He has his little bunny friend prepare an attack and dares the ferocious beast to eat him. It tries to, but 10 seconds have passed already, and he uses repel counter to avoid it. Emil follows that up with a powerful attack, and we see just how much of a glass cannon Rukuro is, as a tiny bit of fall damage takes a large portion of his health. Rukuro praises his furry teammate, but she is just concerned about her sweet threads. Rukuro is confident that the beast must be pretty hurt, but he is shocked when it's nowhere to be found. Just then, the ground begins to shake and Rukuro feels like his feet are being sucked down. They realize that the shark whale thing is preparing to rocket out of the ground for an attack, and Rukuro doesn't even hesitate to save his little friend. Rukuro is surprised to have been thrown into the air since it wasn't an insta-kill attack, and in fact barely did any damage. We learn that the Mud Digger is most noteworthy for its special moveset that activates after its HP reaches a certain threshold. After holding a player in place with the vibrating swamp, it randomly rams one of them in the air with its nose. If a player challenges it alone, not only will it hit them with this attack every single time as long as they remain in the swamp, but it will shave down all their HP through fall damage, hence its nickname the Solo Killer. Rokoro realizes this and hates the person who came up with it since player skills are not even a factor. He considers having Emil hit him from the side, but knows that will just blow him up. Rokuro prepares for his inevitable death and explains that he has never been able to get used to falling deaths in VR games. Luckily for him, our little fur hero is no quitter and she has an unrivaled Vorpal spirit. She uses a magic scroll to teleport Rokuro, but instead of getting to safety, she accidentally puts him back in the air. We learn that there is an attack skill called Meteor Fall that utilizes downward energy. Rokuro had picked up a ton of downward momentum from his initial free fall and built up a lot of energy. Emil's accidental teleportation actually put him just above the beast and allowed Rokuro to gain even more energy. So a fall that would have resulted in player death instead is now a risky attack. This is not an actual meteor fall but a mistake meteor fall. The creature instantly blows up into smithereens and Rokuro is in complete disbelief to see that he actually survived. He can't even digest all the things that just happened so he just compliments Emil for her clutchness. Rokuro acknowledges how tough the fight was, comparing it to when he fought the Lycagon, but this time they were the survivors. Afterward, Emo is shocked to see Birdhead shove a bunch of healing herbs down his throat, and Rokuro points out that it's the only way anything can reach his mouth, because of his giant beak. Rokuro can only think about how Emo was way stronger than he expected. She ended up carrying him, so he feels pretty bad for being so cocky before. Emo can only think about how Rokuro will be staying in Rabatuza full time once they reach the big city. The only problem is that Emil, if seen, will draw a lot of attention like last time, and they might even get jumped. They need to think of a way to hide her, so our little furball determines that she must use something she hasn't in a long time. She reveals her mysterious Vorpal bracelet, the secret treasure of the Vorpal bunnies. The secretive little bunny asks her human counterpart to keep it a secret, and shockingly transforms into a human. Rokuro is speechless and is upset as he begins to realize that Japan's so-called flagship god-tier game is starting to look like some kind of harem game with a bunny girl. The transformation is pretty exhausting for the little rabbit though, so she can only hold it for 4 or 5 minutes at a time in her current state. Her transformation will work just fine to hide her, but it could bring different attention when people see a poor girl dragging around a half-naked bird man. They finally arrive at 3rd Rima where Emo points out how unimpressed Rokuro seems. Beakface proudly points out that he has seen quite a few places in his time, and she is amazed by how well-traveled he is. Emo transforms, but Rokuro is proven right about him being the attention-getter when some guards stop them to ask why he is half-naked. 
They are also pretty curious about his body being covered in scars, but Yuma comes to Rikuro's defense. She states that Rikuro has a past that will bring immense sorrow to all those who hear it. Emo tells the story of his dangerous journey in the most dramatic way possible, a story highlighting the curse Rikuro has on his body and his journey to remove it. Emo gets even more intense as she explains that this is only the first chapter in his story. The second chapter will have him transform into a super warrior. This chick is way too intense for the guards and they just allow them in. Out of the entire crowd that is gathered to watch Emo's theatrics, Rikuro notices someone giving him a look. And it's far different than the normal judgmental look he usually gets for being a half-naked bird face. Before they can enter the city, a girl urgently stops Rikuro as she recognizes him. Rikuro has no clue who this frantic girl is, but we see what happened after those girls in Secondale took their picture. The girls posted the picture on a forum and asked if anyone knew how to befriend the adorable bunny. The post spread rapidly as people were shocked to hear that a monster could talk and almost equally as shocked to see a half-naked bird man. The silvered haired girl was more shocked than anyone. She was certain that the game only allowed players to tame dogs and cats, and determines that the bird must be cheating. As people question the ethics behind posting a picture of someone without their consent, the silvered haired girl begins her mission to find the pigeon man. Other people were paying more attention to Rokuro in the picture. Many have not seen scars like his, especially since nothing like them exists in the character maker. Someone on the forums remembers that it's a curse that also serves as proof that the player has been acknowledged by the Night Emperor. This is only known though because some NPC mentioned it. Players are stunned to realize that this means Rokuro, who they know as Sunraku, his in-game name, has encountered the Lycagon. Some players know that the Lycagon is a random encounter so it is possible for a beginner to run into it, but no one can figure out how this Sunraku guy managed to get acknowledged by it. A player named Orsalot responds on the forums, saying that he could spawn kill Sunraku until he tells him how to do it. Other players think about how dangerous this Orsalot guy is, as he is the esteemed leader of Ashura Kai, a clan infamous for being filled with player killers. Orsalot has his eyes set on Sunraku, so other players wonder if the Birdman will be okay. People discuss on the forums how if you player kill too much, and you get killed by a player or an NPC, all your items are lost, including stored ones. On top of that, the bounty gets paid from the player killer's own cash, so it's a pretty brutal system. One red-headed lady is particularly intrigued by Sunraku and leaves a message on the forums with the hopes of him reading it. She tells him to speak to any player wearing the emblem of a wolf and a sword, as she would love to meet and talk with him. She expresses sorrow for him having so much of his information leaked, but explains that her Saiger clan can help protect him. Other players can see that several clans are showing interest in the now famous Sunraku and point out how he is being treated like an event boss. The crazy silver haired girl is the first to find him though and she just wants to know how to tame a Vorpal bunny. While news of him has spread rapidly, this is Rokuro's first time hearing about it. He realizes it must have been from Secondale but there's no way he's spilling the beans on the Vorpal bunny unique scenario. Just then their conversation is interrupted by a surprise attack. The attacker says that it's not nice to keep things to himself and everyone should share in the fun. This girl shocks Rokuro when she calls him Revolutionary Knight Sunraku-kun. Rokuro seems to know her as he states that the Great Pencil Knight has finally shown her face. This girl doesn't like how he is talking to a self-proclaimed beauty like herself and explains to him that in this game she is not Pencil Knight. She shockingly removes her mask and tells him to refer to her as Arthur Pencilgon. Rokuro is stunned to see that she is not only level 99, but she also has the Skull Badge for being a player killer. Rokuro refers to this person as his friend in Trash Gamerhood. A flashback shows some guys robbing a shop in a game called Unite Rounds. These fools thought they were scot-free, but our boy Rokuro found them and robbed the robbers. The players affectionately call this trash game a post-apocalyptic looting simulator. The game was originally meant to simulate a kingdom on the verge of collapse, with players assuming the role of knights who protect it from attacking monsters, a co-op MMO VR game. However, because of truly garbage game design that prioritized faithfulness to the concept, the drop rates were unreasonably low. Only a few players would ever dare to play this game the right way. Even the beginner's quest required 12 hours of combing through open fields to complete. In the player's eyes, this only left them with one option, steal what they need. Gamers weren't willing to spend hours picking through grass for low-level items when they could just raid an NPC store or steal them from a player who did. That eventually proved to be the winning move in Unite Rounds. In an environment where outrage was everywhere and every person you saw was an enemy, a lone figure arose, fueled by violence to take control of the kingdom. And that person was the Great Pencil Knight. 
One day, Rokuro was looting corpses and Katsu tried to point out that the game was supposed to be about defending the kingdom from monsters. However, Rokuro explained that the game is now really about defeating the big bad Pencil Knight. Pencil Knight was nothing like the final boss built into the game's story. She would intentionally abuse players who she didn't allow into her ranks and instigate her victims to prevent them from giving up on the game. At this time, the game of Unite Rounds was completely at the mercy of one player, the one known as the Dystopian Empress. Rokuro and Katso planned to assassinate her and she is shocked to see them and realized that a rebel army was used as a distraction. Our boys are pretty confident to have gotten this far and tell her that she should have set some more effective traps. The ones she set were so easy that they broke them on the first try. This is their first time meeting but the Empress is impressed and plans to remember their names. The Pencil Knight is pretty annoyed by Rokuro's smirk and she wonders if they can really defeat her to become the Revolutionary Knight. Back to the present, Rokuro thinks about how in Unite Rounds, they fought each other to a draw, with both of them dying in the end. However, in this game, there's a huge level gap between them. Pencilgon instantly initiates the fight and tells Rokuro that she took the penalty and came all the way from Fetisha to player kill him. So he shouldn't be ashamed if he feels like crying because of how flattered he is. Pencilgon is not only a good trash talker, she is a dangerous fighter also, as Rokuro must block daggers that he predicts are poisonous. She knows that Rokuro just beat the mud digger and assumes that he's around level 30, so she compliments him on his impressive dodging skills. However, Rokuro credits the god tier game for making all his moves come nice and smooth. The crazy silver haired girl is shocked while watching the fight when she realizes that Pencilgon is second in command of that one player killer clan, Ashura Kai. She is known as the giant killer. Pencilgon explains that she got the nickname from constantly focusing on ambushing higher level players. Unfortunately, the devs nerfed her ruthless strategy, so it's been a lot harder for her recently. Rokuro is quick to point out how she was the giant in the last game, and the two have a good laugh about the irony. The lighthearted moment doesn't last long though, as Pencilgon continues attacking, and calls our bird-headed hero a bird brain. Emo realizes something while watching, but doesn't say anything and just freaks out in the background. As Pencilgon continues her relentless attack, she reveals that she didn't just find him for personal reasons. The leader of her clan, Ashura Kai, asks her to deliver a message. The leader warns Rokuro to make the information of the unique scenario public, otherwise he will have a target on his back until he does. Our boy does not like being threatened. He thinks this leader of hers sounds like a dummy, and Pencilgon actually agrees. Rokuro does his best to fight back, but he knows that there's far too much of a gap in their levels and equipment. However, he has realized something. Rokuro points out that it seems like Pencilgon is trying pretty hard to keep him away from the gate. He is also certain that she timed that first attack of hers to prevent him from entering the city. He determines that it must be hard for a player killer to do their thing in a highly populated town, and she reveals that she would certainly prefer to avoid it. None of the talking really matters to her though, since she is certain that he won't be making it to the gate alive anyway. Just then, we see what Emo is freaking out about this whole time as her bunny tail reappears, and she can't hold it in any longer. She will soon transform back to a Vorpal bunny, but she has no way of telling Rokuro without anyone finding out. The chaos is mounting as the crazy silver haired girl decides to ask Rokuro's companion about how to get the Vorpal bunny pet. She's surprised to see that Emil's wearing bunny accessories, but even more shocked when Emil transforms into the very bunny she had been desperately searching for like a maniac. Rokuro notices and points out how this is the worst possible moment for this to happen. Pencilgon refuses to be ignored, but is shocked when Rokuro uses his repel counter move. He knocks her back with rage since he knows that she has been holding back, and calls Emil to his side. Our boy catches his little bunny companion, and Silverhair wishes she could at least get a selfie with the little furball. Rokuro explains that he will think about it if he survives his plan, and makes a mad dash towards the gate. Pencilgon is certain that Rokuro has no chance in beating her in a foot race, but is shocked when Silverhair stops her. Silverhair explains that she couldn't care less about Birdface, but if Pencilgon's going to put the sweet little bunny in danger, then she will slay Pencilgon in a heartbeat. Rokuro couldn't be happier as this is what he hoped would happen. He realized that the girl named Animalia was obsessed with his furry companion, and he knew she would put herself in harm's way for her. He praises Emo for being a great mascot, as now all he has to do is get into town. Emo will make him a teleport gate to Rabatuza, and no one should be able to track him there. Rokuro's plan runs into a huge problem though, as Pencilgon explains that she never said she came there alone. Rokuro is met by a group of tough looking players from Pencilgon's clan. They all hate the idea of having to PK a lower level player, but they must do it as they fear getting player killed themselves by Pencilgon if they don't. Pencilgon realizes that Animalia is the keeper of SF Zoo, a monster documenter clan with no interest in other players, 
and she thanks Rokuro for giving her this opportunity. Rokuro isn't even listening though as he has his hands full trying to keep from being ended by the group. Animalia shows that she isn't just some crazy animal lover and unleashes a powerful spell. Unfortunately, Pencilgon consumes the attack and fires it right back at Animalia. Pencilgon is pretty impressed by all the status debuffs Animalia has acquired, and Animalia is shocked because Pencilgon was able to reflect all the curses in her attack. Pencilgon reveals the amazing item that allowed her to do this, the Karmic Straw Doll. Pencilgon knows she would have been in big trouble without it and crushes the thing. The item, when crushed, sends all curses applied to the player back at their caster, so the cold-blooded Pencilgon assures Animalia that she will stick around to watch her die of her own poison. Rikuro's doing his best to stay alive against opponents who outnumber him, are a higher level than him, and have far better equipment than him. He analyzes them to determine that his best target is the jerk who uses a slow-moving longsword, since Rikuro doesn't even need skills to dodge his attacks. The real problem is how he will do damage to the high level players decked out in top tier armor. Things are looking pretty bad but luckily someone has arrived to absolutely destroy one of the attackers with a single blow. Every one of the attackers is shocked as they realize that this was the unparalleled firepower of the famous attack master. Rokuro has no clue who this person is but can't believe another person has arrived with such a dangerous sounding nickname. However we know that this giant armored knight is actually Rokuro's stalker Rei and she is glad to have finally found the apple of her eye. A flashback shows how upset Rei was after not being able to find Rikuro no matter how hard she looked, and she thought about how Mana told her to confess her feelings to him. She thought about how Rikuro always played games that were so unusual and difficult. They were always too hard for her to play so she could never find a game that she could play with him. However, that all changed with SLF. Rikuro was finally playing it so she refused to let her opportunity get away. When she returned to the game, she found that a message was waiting for her. It was another member of her guild, Saiger, that is also her sister. The message revealed Rikuro's location and asked Rei to get into contact with him. This was Rei's first real chance to find him, so she wasted no time in rushing to him. The message also revealed that there were a number of clans already arranging to make contact with him, and the dangerous Ashurikai was among them. Rei saw him deep in battle and realized that it was a great opportunity that she would never have again. If she could save him from the PKers, she would have a natural in to talk to him. This drove her more than anything because she's crushing on him pretty hard and knew that this could someday lead to them talking in real life. That is when she made her explosive entrance and Pencilgon could instantly tell that things were getting intense. Pencilgon knew all along that the PKers from her clan would have a tough time against Rokuro. However, fighting him in SLF has made something even more clear to her. The skills he's built up playing terrible games in all genres are more valuable than unique items and high level stats. And that's a huge asset in Shangri-La Frontier. She has also heard that Katsu is playing SLF as well, so with Rakuro, some secret project of hers is looking more possible. Pencilgon is then shocked when she realizes that the person that has joined the fight is Saiger Zero. Somehow Rakuro first lured in the zookeeper and now the attack master. Pencilgon is incredibly happy to have come, but Animalia isn't done just yet as she points out that she hit Pencilgon with 5 spells. She explains that the doll Pencilgon used tops out at reflecting 5 debuffs, and she wonders if Pencilgon has a counter for her next attack. A look into the past shows Rei stalking Rokuro so hard that she runs into a pole. He was always smiling and enjoying himself so that is why she started thinking about him. She started looking for him and eventually developed elite level stalking skills. She tried talking to him on several occasions, but she was always too shy. Back to the present, Rei won't let her opportunity pass her by, so she comes to Rokuro's rescue. Rokuro is instantly suspicious of this giant knight, and he assumes that they are after the unique scenario just like everyone else. He knows that he needs to think of a way out, and luckily for him, it looks like Animalia is preparing to do something. Animalia's final attack requires the mastery skill and single digit HP. This chick is just another crazy person in this anime as she explains that her next attack is a murder-suicide curse that destroys her opponent and herself. Pencilgon has already used her doll and has no way to debuff the spell so the two of them are eliminated. The attack causes a massive eruption of light shocking everyone but this is Rakuro's chance. He tells his furry little friend to prepare a gate for them and apologizes to the knight for using its head as a launch pad. Birdface runs as fast as he can and the enemy group wants to stop him from reaching the city since it's filled with bounty hunters. Unfortunately for them, Rei is too powerful and knocks them back. Rokuro still doesn't trust the giant knight but promises to remember their name, Saiger Zero. The Shurikai members are furious but Rei is completely distracted. 
She can't believe that Rikura actually talked to her and his apology replays over and over again in her head. The Shurikai guys see this as an opportunity to earn some fame and make an attempt to attack the attack master. Unfortunately for them, she is furious because they were the reason she couldn't talk to Rikuro more. The Shurikai members prepare to run away, but Rei doesn't let them as she still has a lot of anger to take out on them. We then see that Rikuro and Emo have finally made it back to the inn inside of Rabatuza. Emo ran out of magic from using her transformation earlier, but luckily our boy was prepared and bought magic restoring items ahead of time. Just then, Rikuro receives what he calls a sore loser email from Pencilgon. She is in disbelief that the attack master appeared from nowhere to save him, and she points out that her death was her own fault, so she didn't really lose to him. Pencilgon still wants to talk to Rokuro, so she tells him to call Katso so the three of them can have a meeting in the game Unite Rounds. It's a bit strange that she doesn't just want to talk in SLF, so he is suspicious of her. Just then, Katso emails him after he was messaged by Pencilgon as well. Katso shares Rokuro's skepticism, but they are both also very intrigued by what she might have to say. They decide not to back down, but for now Rikuro has bigger things to worry about. Emo finishes her delicious potion, and Rikuro eagerly explains that he is ready to get this unique scenario going. Rikuro wonders what the Mafia Rabbit boss meant by getting him up to snuff, so Emo decides to just show him by taking Rikuro to the arena where they do their most serious battle training. They arrive at the Vorpal Coliseum, and Rikuro marvels at how huge it is. Emo reveals that her father slash boss wants Rikuro to fight 10 monsters there. Rikuro is excited for this boss rush type of training, and Emil explains that he will be strictly limited to the use of Vorpal weapons. That's totally fine for our boy, and he prepares to grind levels until he can wipe the smug smirk off of Pencilgon's face. Rikuro gets a good stretch in before pulling out his Vorpal Blades of Death, and has the first monster come out. Our protagonist is pretty realistic, as he doesn't expect to go 10 in a row on his first try. He plans to use trial and error to learn their attack patterns so he can slowly but surely attain victory. He is pretty shocked by his first opponent though, since it's a pack of hounds that always spawn in groups of 5 or more. Their average level is 65, so Rokuro wonders if there has been some kind of mistake. His ruthless little bunny friend explains that there is no mistake, and that's just how the first opponent works. Rokuro knows he has his hands full, and is instantly wiped out by the pack. Back in the real world, Rei celebrates the fact that Rokuro talked to her, and she replays the moment in her mind. That isn't enough for the little stalker though, as she reminds herself to find the courage to send him a friend request the next time they see each other. She wonders if he would accept, and imagines her boy saying yes. Ray imagines that they will become friends in real life after that, and this sends her over the roof with joy. The problem is that she searched for him in 3rd Rima after she was done with the goons, but couldn't find him so she wonders what he could be doing. We then see what he is doing as he stares down the hounds. It's pretty clear that these hounds just think of him as food, and Emo points out that this is already Rikuro's seventh attempt. Thankfully, the penalty for dying isn't applied in the arena. However, it's not just the sheer number of these beasts and their high level that is a huge pain for our beak-faced hero, it's their completely synchronized attacks. Rikuro does his best on the seventh try, and he realizes that their coordination is the result of having a commander giving orders. He has fought them enough times, so he has started to see it. One of these monsters has been howling from a safe distance and never actually fights. Armed with this knowledge, our boy uses his spiral edge attack on their leader. This monster just runs away while the others rush to protect it. Their coordination gets all out of whack, so he knows that he was right. Knowing this, all Rokuro has to do is ignore the others and focus on the commander before he can bark out orders. He hunts down the leader of the pack and Emo cheers for him when he eliminates it. With their master gone, there's really nothing left for him to fear, so he wipes out the uncoordinated bunch. Rokuro completes the first level of training, and Emo celebrates her bird-faced hero. Rokuro hopes that the next round won't be another group of monsters, and Emo assures him that the next one is definitely a single opponent. He really hopes that's the case, but is shocked when he sees that the next opponent is called the Parasite Tentacle. This hideous creature is just a teddy bear with snakes coming out its back, so this makes Rokuro think that it's practically another group. Rokuro used a hit and run strategy against the beast tentacles. Once all the tentacles were severed, the bear stopped moving and he won. It only took him 4 tries. A really tough goblin was his third opponent, but it was easier than the previous two. This one only took him 2 tries. Some wild boar was his fourth opponent, but our boy has some in-game rodeo experience and used that to defeat it on his first try. His fifth opponent was a doozy though. It was some crazy acid pooping bird, and this thing took him 112 tries. The next few opponents were relatively easy, and only took him one try each. 
Our hero's ninth opponent was some Mega Golem. It had some type of invisible energy shield that shaved off 70% of his HP when repelled by it. He eventually figured out that he needed to tear it down little by little, and he defeated it on his seventh try. Our boy is more excited than ever as he only has one opponent left, but is pretty upset to see that after all that fighting, he has only gone up two measly levels. This is of course because of the Vorpal Soul Collar that Vash forced onto him, which generously cuts his experience gains in half. Emil encourages the bird brain to take a break since she has noticed that Rekuro has a terrible look in his eyes. Our boy doesn't think so though and makes a funny looking face as he states that all the optimization is going great for him. Rokuro demands that the next monster come forward and he is shocked to see that Vash has come for a visit. Vash is impressed that Rokuro has already reached the final level and points out that the timing couldn't be any more perfect. Rokuro knows that there was no coincidence as he thinks about how beating the ninth monster just triggered an event flag. Vash explains that for Rokuro's final opponent, he will have him fight a monster that he just caught. Vash really had to go out of the way to get this monster and he sends the chained up beast into the arena. Vash frees the creature and our boy can't figure out what kind of monster it is. He thinks it's some dummy from long ago that tried to fuse with a tree to gain a longer life. Vash observes closely and doubts that Rekuro can beat this monster in his current state. Because of this, he changes the win criteria. This monster is apparently insanely strong, so all Rekuro will have to do to win is survive for 5 minutes. This thing is a wood mage, but Rekuro is eager to prove that he can complete the level. Rekuro is confident for this test of endurance, but is instantly surprised by the monster's first attack. This crazy tree thing creates roots out of nowhere and forces Rekuro to run for his life. Vash explains that he is a big fan of Rekuro's confidence, but points out that he will really have to back it up now if he wants to survive. Rekuro is getting pretty stressed evading all of its attacks and realizes that it's going to be a really long 5 minutes. Out of the over 30 million SLF players, Rekuro is the first one to fight this terrifying monster. Rokuro wouldn't learn this until far in the future, but we see that this tree mage is an insane level 120. Rokuro does his best to avoid all the roots, but they are seemingly endless. Our boy is crazy as he attempts to close the gap with the monster even though all he needs to do is survive. Getting close doesn't do much though since Rokuro's attack doesn't even scratch the tree branch wizard. It's pretty clear that physical attacks won't work on it and Rokuro must now dodge this thing's chains as well. The bird brain realizes that he should just dodge his way to victory and Emil reveals that one minute has already passed. Four minutes remain so Vash is eager to see Rokuro's Vorpal soul. Rokuro continues to dodge away but it's getting more difficult and he realizes that his opponent is an absolute beast. Root spear attacks that are almost impossible to dodge since they aren't telegraphed and chains that look like they will destroy anything they come in contact with. As if those things weren't terrifying on their own, they also chase him around like he is a magnet to them. It's almost enough to make him give up on dodging altogether, and Nemo becomes increasingly concerned for him. Even with all that, there is still something worse. This tree monster keeps on slipping in magic attacks every now and then. Some are electrical and some are fireballs. The more time passes, the more this wooden Harry Potter mixes up its magic types. This time it uses an ice spell attack, and Ruo can hardly manage to survive it all as the attacks seem to be getting denser as well. The number of chains and roots are increasing and the magic attacks are starting to cover a wider area. The magical tree branch gives a menacing look and Rekuro determines that if the density of the attacks keep increasing, he will be dead well before he reaches 5 minutes. Just then, purple mist erupts from the ground and it's just another spell from the tree's arsenal that Rekuro has to worry about. The fight is beginning to seem futile since this thing can nullify physical attacks and constantly adds attacks of its own. Rikuro begins to think that he would have a better chance against the Lycagon that gave him his scars, and he really begins to lose hope. He is getting so tired that he can barely even think straight anymore. Rikuro is ready to give up, return home to eat something while he thinks of a strategy, and try again later. There isn't really a penalty for losing, so he doesn't really care anymore. Just then, Rikuro snaps himself out of it and reminds himself that he is in a pushover. He went through the same feeling of hopelessness against the Mud Digger when he gave up and had to rely on Emil. Rekuro lets out a battle cry as he is reinvigorated and refuses to let himself cut corners. He thinks that playing so many trash games all his life almost turned his brain into garbage as well, but that ends now. Emil and Vash can sense that something has changed and Rekuro makes another push. He states that he has overloaded on trash gamium and needs to balance it out with god gamium. Rekuro runs along a route to once again get close to the tree and promises himself that he won't give up. 
Vash is impressed that he was able to break through the waves of attacks to reach melee range, but says that there really is no point since Rokuro can only dish out basic attacks. Rokuro shocks everyone though when he kicks the monster's staff out of its hand. Rokuro is seriously tired so he's ready to just beat the living tree and go straight to bed. He realized that even though the monster can nullify physical damage, the attack itself still gets through. Rokuro doesn't let the tree branch get its staff back and he wonders what will happen to the tree if it has to fight without it. It's clear that it can't cast its spells anymore, but it still has its roots and chains. Something that Rokuro did learn from all his years of gaming is that in a post-apocalyptic world, you survive by looting. He uses the snatching skills he learned from Unite Rounds and grabs hold of the staff. Vash and Emil are both impressed, but there's still two minutes left on the timer, and this is a time when Vash wants to see what Rokuro can really do. The tree goes insane and Rokuro realizes that losing the staff must trigger its berserk mode. The attacks are getting more intense, so Rokuro wishes he would have gotten some kind of warning. Little Emil continues cheering on our brave hero and tells him that he only needs to survive for one more minute. This is exactly what Rokuro's mobility build was made for, so there's no way he's going to lose after getting so close. However, one of the chains eventually grabs a hold of him, and just as he expected, it applies several debuffs. He won't be able to dodge, and the tree wizard is closing in on him. Rokuro sends the staff straight into the sky, causing the tree to go after it instead. The tree finally retrieves it, but Rokuro can't believe that the monster actually fetched it. Rokuro mocks the dumb monster since it would've won if it just kept attacking, but now the time is up. He calls it a wood blockhead, but is shocked when the monster just decides to continue attacking. Rokuro runs for his life while pointing out that the fight should be over. Luckily, Vash steps in since the 5 minutes are over and completely deletes the monster right out of the game. Rokuro is the winner and Vash is really impressed by his Vorpal soul. Rokuro can't believe Vash just decimated it and wonders how he was able to land a physical attack on it. Vash explains that it can only nullify physical attacks when it has its staff, and without its staff, it's just an animated tree. Emil arrives to celebrate, and Rokuro is excited to hear that he will now be getting his reward for completing the quest. Vash declares him an honorary Rabbituzin, but Rokuro thought winning would come with a rare item or something. Vash removes the Vorpal collar around Rokuro's neck, officially completing the unique scenario, and the little rabbits leave. Surprisingly, there is a bonus unique scenario called Vorpal Epic. However, Rokuro is just upset that he didn't get a single piece of real loot and logs out of the game. It's pretty late, so Rokuro decides to just get some sleep. The next morning, Rokuro reads that the recommended level for the bonus unique scenario is 80, but he's only level 31. There is lore behind the quest, but he gave up on reading it all when he was overwhelmed. There are entire clans dedicated to learning all the lore in the game, so it would be very difficult for him to do so on his own. Rokuro decides to take a break from all the unique scenario stuff. Instead, he will check out the town and head for the next area. Emil finishes up watering her plants and is ready to move forward as well. Rokuro realizes that if he goes out looking like he does, then he will surely get mobbed by PKers and info hunters again. Changing his headgear won't be enough either since his like a good marks would draw attention too. Emil proves to be as useful as ever and recommends that he cover his entire form. He has no clue how to do that, but she knows just the place. They go to see a little rabbit named Pete's, who is actually Emil's little brother. He acquires goods and sells them in Rabbituza. He sells in other places as well, but he has to transform into a human to do it, so he doesn't do it much. The little bunny calls him a birdman, so Rokuro proves he is a human by removing his mask. Emil is shocked that he removed his mask for a moment, since she was sure that he had some deep dark reason for keeping it on all the time. Emil asks about the rare thing that Peach just found, and he goes looking for it in his inventory. Afterwards, we see that this item looks like some kind of bed sheet, and Rokuro looks like he's wearing a ghost costume on Halloween. They go to get a map for the area around Third Rima, and Rokuro gets all sorts of weird looks. Moments later, Rokuro can't hold back anymore and states just how much he hates the bedsheet costume looking thing. Rokuro calms down as he realizes that at least he got everything he needed. Rokuro points out that Emil burns through magic power really fast when in human form as she chugs down another potion. They need to get moving to the next area and they have three routes they can take. One is the Felfate Caldera a place where water has collected in the crater of a long extinct volcano to form a lake. The second is the prismatic forest grotto, a maze of caverns overgrowing with plant life. The last route is the iron ruins of divinity, ruins from the era of divinity that gets its name from its many hovering iron boards. Rokuro realizes the seriousness of this decision and tells Emil to quiet down when she recommends going to the Felfate Caldera. 
Rokuro decides to go through the prismatic forest and explains his brilliant decision. He declares that they must avoid the ruins of divinity at all costs because he believes it's a trap. While Rokuro is busy complimenting his own genius, Emo notices a person she kind of remembers watching them. This armored person looks like a creepy stalker and Rokuro is shocked to see who it is. Elsewhere, we find a ship parked somewhere and we meet the leader of the clan of Shurikai called Orsalot. He is disappointed in his clan for failing him and disgracing their clan. They apologize and blame their failure on the arrival of the attack master. Orsalot doesn't want to hear any excuses though. The secret of a unique scenario is on the line so they should have expected top players to show up. Pencilgon is part of this clan and fearlessly tells Orsalot that he should have just done it himself. He says that he was busy and explains that the rabbit they are after is definitely the key to a bunch of secret stuff. Orsalot wants answers so he tells the group to get them out of Rokuro by any means necessary. Pencilgon thinks that they should be going after unique monsters instead but Orsalot reminds her that these monsters aren't made to be beatable. As of right now they are the only ones that know the unique monster's spawn condition. Players get experience just by encountering the beast, so if they plan it correctly, they can use it to get way stronger. Everyone agrees not to go after the monster, but Pencilgon thinks that they are all useless. Orsalot tries to stop her from leaving, but she has important things to do. A Shurikai was always widely hated on, so they decided to thrive on hate. However, the last patch made player killing much riskier, so the clan has changed. Pencilgon can't believe that she's putting her neck on the line for one little NPC, and states that it's a huge gamble for her win or lose. She is willing to sacrifice everything to bury the unique monster, one of the seven colossi called Weatherman the Tomb Guard. Back with our bird-headed hero, Rakura was worried that Sagar Zero is there to get revenge for stepping on him. Sagar Zero moves towards them but Rakura is terrified and tells Emo that it's time to run. Nearby, members of Ashurakai are looking for Rakura. Rakura runs near them but they just think he is some crazy dude wearing a bedsheet. Unfortunately, players' names hover above their head, so the guys notice that it's Rokuro's in-game name, Sunraku. They won't be confused by his ghost costume and chase after him. He is causing quite a scene, but he doesn't have much of a choice as the knight is following him. Rokuro tells Emo that it's time to head to the next area, and the Ashurakai guys determine that the bird brain will be heading to the Iron Ruins. They contact their other members and prepare to have an ambush ready at the exit gate. Emo reminds Rokuro that he said they would be going to the Prismatic Forest Grotto and he explains that he's going in the wrong direction to fake everyone out. He knows that they will be waiting for him at the gate but he plans to lose them in an alley. His plan works as they lose sight of Rokuro and decide to just wait at the gate towards the Iron Ruins. Our genius protagonist disguised himself perfectly using his bedsheet and teaches Emil a thing or two about deception. They eventually reach their real destination but are stunned when Sagar Zero appears behind them. Rokuro still thinks the giant knight is a guy and fears the worst. He gets a bit of relief though when Sagar Zero just sends him a friend request. Sagar Zero mumbles that she wants to be friends but her voice is so low that Rokuro can't hear a single word. Rokuro begins to wonder if she is a girl but becomes skeptical. He thinks she might be trying to get his guard down but realizes that he would have been a goner already if the attack master wanted it. Rokuro has some serious trust issues and wonders if she's trying to befriend him so that he will spill the beans about the scenario. He determines that the giant knight must be plotting something since she was able to see through his disguise and determine his destination. Rokuro is confident though since he is a gamer who has been through all kinds of PvP before. He is ready for anything so he plans to play right into her hands and he is certain that he can still beat her. Rokuro accepts the friend request and the little stalker's dream has finally come true. We then see that her finding him was complete luck but she couldn't be happier. She tells Rokuro that she can help him through the game but someone has seriously broken Rokuro's trust before. He takes her simple offer as proof that she is trying to get him in her debt so she can demand information from him. Rokuro declines her offer by saying that he doesn't want to get carried so she apologizes and emphatically wishes him luck. Rokuro apologizes for using her giant head as a step stool before but she says it's okay and he can do it anytime. The two say goodbye and Rokuro thinks it's odd how she backed off so quickly. Emo thinks the knight looks pretty powerful and Rokuro determines that Sagar Zero is probably around 4 or 5 times stronger than him. Emo says that Rokuro has a stronger Vorpal soul though but our birdman still has no clue what a Vorpal soul is. Ray just watches him leave and Rokuro decides to just put the whole encounter behind him. 
Ray realizes that the girl he was with is an NPC, but doesn't care about anything when she remembers that Rikuro finally accepted her friend request. The Ashurakai boys realize that they have been tricked and decide to head towards the prismatic forest. They spot the terrifying attack master just standing there though and decide to run away instead. At the forest, our duo can finally relax so Emo reverts back to being a bunny and our hero goes back to being a bird. The tunnel is covered in glowing moss and Rikuro explains that he has seen tons of things while coming out of tunnels in other games. Guns aimed at him and beautiful shooting stars. However, this amazing forest trumps it all. The site is beautiful and the forest is home to very unique creatures. These include empire work bees and some insects that double as storage. Bugs are taking each other out left and right and Rikuro gets excited as nothing beats entering a new area. Rikuro is a little low on cash from stocking up on items so he decides to take down one of the storage bugs in hopes of finding a valuable item. He fails miserably though and points out that the insect is pretty light on its wings despite its gigantic pot belly. It's still too slow for a bird like him and Rikuro destroys it. Luckily he was right, as long as he doesn't damage the stomach he can snag it as an item. Emo can't contain her excitement and Rikuro decides that they should keep gathering up as many item drops as they can. Rikuro spots their next prey and Emo surprised to see that he bought a throwing knife at some point. Melee is his only combat option but he got pretty traumatized from getting pooped on by the poop bird in the arena. The throwing knife is a consumable item but it's a great way to attack from a distance. Rikuro uses the knife to attack a flower but he knew all along that it was a camouflaged mantis. He demands that it turn into loot for him and he destroys it. Emo cheers on her hero and Rikuro explains that the mantis are pretty easy to defeat without their camouflage ambushing tricks. Rikuro checks his inventory to find that he has gotten a ton of loot already but there's one creature he hasn't defeated yet. Just then the ground shakes as that creature just so happens to appear. It's a giant beetle and it's at least 5 meters long. It's drinking tree sap on the empire bees turf but the bees aren't having any of it. The bees attack the lone beetle and Rikuro is amazed since they are clearly following their queen's orders. Our boy begins a play by play of the fight and points out that the beetle is hanging in there. Emil is next to do some color commentary but she isn't too good at improvisation. The fierce battle rages on and the beetle uses its horn to attack while making its way towards the bee's nest. Emil is finally ready to jump in with commentary but simply says that the beetle is big. Our boy steps up with more intense commentary and points out that the bees have created several weak points in the beetle's armor. The queen bee is just about to command her army to finish the fight but the beetle shockingly goes straight for the queen. The beetle was just waiting to get into the queen's range and is now victorious. With no leader the rest of the bees scatter and the beetle goes back to munching on its meal. Rikuro admires the warrior beetle but this beetle is insane and it goes after them next. They run for their lives and Rikuro tries to explain that he just wanted to collect the loot that the bees dropped. Emo points out that the beetle must have thought that they wanted his sap and Rikuro comes up with an idea. He tosses a stomach sack causing it to burst on a mantis and the beetle goes after it instead. The tables have turned now so Rikuro targets the cracks in the beetle's armor. He lands a ton of critical strikes thanks to his good luck and the once proud warrior beetle is now a pile of nothing. Rikuro has an inventory full of stuff now so he puts a hold on collecting more. Emo didn't like the idea of exploiting the labor of all the bees but Rikuro explains that they live in a bug eat bug world. Rikuro remembers that the area boss there is a spider and Emo explains that it's called the clown spider. There are spider webs everywhere now so Rikuro assumes that they must be getting closer to the boss. Rikuro decides to fearlessly enter a cave but we see that the terrifying spider is waiting for him. A quick look into the recent past shows another group and one girl is terrified that their leader wants to fight the area boss so soon. Their leader tells her to quiet down as he is confident they can win but this guy just ends up getting stuck on a spider web. The girls become terrified and we see why as they have just encountered the horrifying clown spider. Back to the present where Crow makes his way toward the cave. However, he is not allowed to enter as other players are currently fighting the area boss. The pink haired guy from earlier comes crashing down and laments how he will have to climb all the way back up again. Pinky is still confident that he can turn this terrible situation around but he just ends up getting flattened like a pancake. Rikuro says a prayer for the fallen adventurer but he is ready for his turn now. The innocent little Emil is shocked that he's able to move on so fast but Rikuro reminds her that players will just respawn right back in third Rima. They make their way into the cave and find the corpses of the poor players that came before them. Rikuro shows his supreme confidence as he tells Emil to stay back. 
He plans to beat the clown spider all by himself without dying or taking damage. Emo thinks our boy is absolutely insane, but he has already made his decision and he calls out the area boss. The higher up Brokuro climbs, the denser the webs get. Luckily, he has some new skills after leveling up in the arena. He tries to decide which would be best to use in this situation, but he must quickly turn his attention to avoid a falling boulder. He uses his new skill called One Boat Leap and he's able to easily avoid it. Emo just barely manages to survive and warns our hero to be careful with the webs in front of him. She fears that he will get stuck to them, but is shocked when he doesn't. Our boy is some kind of spider expert as he reveals that horizontal radial lines of spider webs aren't sticky. Some more rocks come crashing down, but he should be fine as long as he pays attention to where he is stepping. His carefulness combined with an acceleration skill allows him to climb much faster, and Emo is left to dodge falling rocks to save her life. Rekuro finally comes face to face with the clown spider and dodges a few of its pitiful attacks. Rekuro then uses a new skill called Loop Slash and slices off one of the spider's legs. That's clearly not enough to win, so he uses a skill called Rush Slash to do way more damage. The stupid spider isn't able to keep its balance so it falls, and Rekuro determines that falling from this height would deal quite the fall damage. The spider tries to poop out some web to save itself, but our boy shuts that down instantly with its throwing knife. The spider slams down into the ground, and Rekuro already knows that it won't be enough to end its life. A look at the ceiling shows that this spider has a collection of heavy stuff to drop, so Rekuro comes up with an idea. The clown spider gets ready for round two, but our boy has already started dropping boulders and trees to crush the spider. The spider is getting collapsed on and Emo celebrates, as it really does seem like her hero will beat the spider unscathed. The spider begins to get up, and Emo wonders what our crazy protagonist is doing as he begins to descend. It turns out that Rekuro isn't satisfied by winning this way since if he can't even beat a mere area boss head on, then he won't be good enough to take down the Lycagon. Rekuro comes crashing down on the spider to land a critical strike and the area boss completely explodes. Emo then comes to celebrate as Rekuro is announced the winner. He beat it just like he promised, no damage and no death. Just then he gets a message from the pencil knight, but he isn't the only one. Some blonde girl got the message too. She is pretty disappointed since she heard a lot of talk about bosses being tough to solo, but she just did it to the mud digger. This player is actually Katso and she looks forward to something that will actually challenge her. Back at the game shop, Rei excitedly tells Mana that she doesn't have to stalk Rekuro like a creep anymore because they are friends now. Rei gushes over her crush since he was able to skip past First Town and has somehow brought with him an untamable Vorpal bunny. Rei gets excited when she thinks Rekuro has arrived at the shop but it's just some random guy. It turns out that Rekuro hasn't come to the shop in several days, so Mana assumes that he is playing SLF. Rekuro is a pretty unpredictable guy, so she assumes that he will be the first one to defeat a unique monster. Rei walks home but is stunned when she just so happens to find our boy minding his own business in another store. Rei instantly goes back to her stalking ways and watches him closely. In a magazine, Rekuro reads about his friend Katso's interview. Katso is a pro gamer but also a massive trash talker. Rokuro also reads that a huge summer update will be coming to SLF, and he thinks about how he just had his meeting with Pencilgon. A look back at the meeting inside another game shows Pencilgon pointing out that it's been so long since her guests have visited. The last time they all saw each other was when they attacked her castle and took on the 80 players guarding it. Her guests are Rokuro and Katso. The two boys reminisce about how fun it was to destroy her castle, and they really dig in as they point out how Pencilgon is still really butthurt about it. Pencilgon gets their attention as she has had enough and reminds them that they have business to discuss. She gets right to the point and asks them to team up with her to beat a specific unique monster, Weatherman the Tomb Guard. The two boys ponder it for a moment but then express how shocked they are. It's a unique monster just like the Lycagon Rekuro fought so Katso is really interested in uniques. Pencilgon explains just how serious she is but Rekuro thought they were just meeting to talk about fighting a high level clan or something. Rokuro points out that it's just the three of them and wonders if she really thinks they can do it themselves as he has no clue about this Weathermon monster. Pencilgun explains that Weathermon is not the kind of guy that can be taken down with numbers. She tried with a team of Ashurakai's 15 best members but they failed. It's the type of monster that gets stronger against more opponents but that isn't all. Pencilgun then refuses to tell them more until they agree to join her. Her plan is to attack two weeks from now 
at night right after they push out the massive summer event. Rokuro thinks it over and wonders why she is asking two players that just started playing the game when she could just ask a couple of max level players. Pencilgon seems to be able to read his mind as she explains that their low levels don't matter. What she needs is pure gaming skills. That is why she chose Katso who is a pro gamer and Rokuro who has godly skills as a trash game player. Rokuro wonders if their skills are really that comparable and gets upset when his buddy Katso doesn't think so. Pencilgon just wants their answers and is open to hearing what they would want as an extra reward. Rokuro says that he understands the situation well but he can tell that she is still hiding something. He doesn't agree to anything yet and tells her that she needs to tell them her secret. Pencilgon tells them what it is but we don't get the privilege of hearing it. In the real world Rokuro leaves the shop and Rei calls out to him from her hiding spot. Rokuro is caught off guard and just remembers her as being some girl in one of his classes a year ago. Rei awkwardly just stares at him and Rokuro desperately tries to remember her name. Luckily he remembers at the last second and Rei points out how big of a coincidence it is for them to meet there. Our boy was just buying typical gamer supplies and Rei was heading to judo practice. Rei brings up how Mana told her that he is playing SLF and she tells him how she is playing also. She would like to play together sometime but Rokuro gets distracted by a message. It's an urgent message from Pencil Gun, so he tells Rei goodbye and blasts out of there. Rei is just glad that she was able to form some words to talk to Rokuro. Rokuro bought so many energy drinks which means he must be planning to have a long gaming session so she hopes to meet him in game again. At home Rokuro loads up SLF and wonders if he should have asked for Rei's in game name. In the game Emil greets him a little too closely and Rokuro reveals that he has something to tell her. Rokuro reveals that he will be fighting Weathermon the Tomb Guard in two weeks and he is thinking of removing Emil from the party during that time. Emil absolutely loses her mind after hearing the name Weathermon and instantly rushes off to go tell her mafia boss father. Rokuro has no clue what that was all about but has no time to find out since he needs to meet with Pencilgon. A look back at their meeting shows that Rokuro asked Pencilgon about bringing along Emil who was an NPC. Pencilgon is of course familiar with the little bunny and tells him that if he really cares about Emil then he should take her off his party. She then shockingly reveals that in SLF once an NPC dies they won't get respawned. Sometime later we see that Emil's father has summoned Rokuro to hear his plan straight from his mouth. He wants to know if it's true that Rokuro plans to pick a fight with the one known as the Death Defier. Rokuro instantly realizes that this sudden event must be important. The best tactic he can use right now to talk to this mafia boss is to role play in this scenario and its characters. If he does it right he might get some valuable information about Weatherman. Rokuro determines that he must persuade Vash to get on his side and the key will be to use the word Vorpal Soul. Vash reminds Rokuro that he is too weak to take on Weatherman. Rokuro dramatically reveals that he isn't taking on this challenge because he thinks he can win. He explains that he will only be acting as a support as his teammate will be doing most of the fighting. Rokuro explains that a group of murderers are taking advantage of Weatherman for selfish gain. They rack up tons of experience just by encountering him over and over again. Rokuro's teammate is the defector of this group and she wants to end the fight once and for all. Rokuro explains that she has taken every measure to assure victory but Vash counters that it doesn't matter how many measures they take. If they aren't strong enough then they are just going on a mission of self destruction. Death missions are not what having a Vorpal soul is all about and Vash taught him better than that. Rokuro has no intention of losing and explains that he and his friends simply want to support their leader's will to win against Weatherman. Rokuro explains that coming to her aid is really just upholding his own Vorpal soul. He tells Vash that all he needs is two weeks. Two weeks for Vash to take Rokuro who acknowledges he is an inexperienced fool and turn him into a worthy challenger against a strong foe. Vash seems to get convinced as he begins talking about honor. He states that a certain man is very awkward and Rokuro wonders if he is talking about Weatherman. This man is overly serious never knowing when to stop. He lost his wife over a little lie and because of that he is cursed with an undying body. He is now just a walking corpse unable to even put himself to rest. For that reason someone needs to beat him down and put him to sleep. Vash swore not to lay upon this man himself but since Rokuro is so insistent then he won't stop him. On top of that Vash even has his beloved daughter insisting. 
Vashton has Rakuro follow him as he agrees to give him a hand. Rakuro is then shocked when they arrive at a blacksmith's forge. He celebrates for a moment as he did a good job in getting to the next stage of the Rabatuza event. Vash calls upon the blacksmith named Bylock, who is also another one of Emo's siblings. That's already three kids so far, so Rakuro wonders if all the money is in Rabatuza or Vash's children. Rakuro is introduced, and Bylock says he looks just like a person named Evil. Vash takes a look at Rakuro's Vorpal weapons and is glad to see that Rakuro was accepted by his weapons nicely. Vash states that he will be ascending the weapons, but Bylock is shocked to hear that. She can't believe that Vash will be wielding the hammer himself, but Vash explains that he must. If Rakuro is going to take on the Death Defier, he can't just sit there and do nothing about it. Bylock becomes extremely excited and goes to get the forge started. Vash asks Rakuro if he has any good materials that he got after a difficult battle, so Rakuro searches through his inventory. He eventually finds something and hands Vash a quad beetle shell. It was able to withstand the Empire Bees for a really long time, so it should be good material. Vash agrees and gets himself ready. Bylock explains that Rakuro should consider himself very lucky since their boss has not held a hammer in several years. The last time was even before he became the King of Rabbits. Emil reveals that Vash is actually a skilled blacksmith, and he is not an ordinary one either. His expertise in forging allows him to call himself a master craftsman, and his know-how on Age of Divinity's forgery makes him an ancient craftsman. As a master of both, he is a divine craftsman, the supreme blacksmith, second to none. Emil becomes excited as her father is ready to begin. Vash hammers away at Rakuro's weapons, and Rakuro is surprised to see magic circles appear. They pop out with every strike and are then absorbed into the weapon. Bylock reveals that ascending involves reading the memories and experience that weapons earn in battle, remolding them into what they are meant to be. Put differently, it's a technique that ascends weapons to their true form. Weapons with Vorpal in their name remember battles against strong opponents. Vash is taking their memories of fighting in Rakuro's hand and the power of the strong foe instilled in the material he gave Vash. He then mixes those two elements together to change the weapon's form. Bylock points out that Rakuro fought the Lycagon evenly, so she can't wait to see what weapon will result from that. Vash begins to sing and Rakuro must be told to quiet down as this is a very important moment. The little rabbits are in awe to witness the master at work, and Vash just keeps wailing on the weapon. After some time, Vash finally proclaims that the Vorpal Choppers have acquired their true form and name. They are now the Moonblade Waxing and the Moonblade Waning weapons. They are two swords from one blade, and only when they are paired together will they show their true value. Rokuro is of course excited about this amazing feat, and immediately goes to check their stats. For the Waxing one, when used in a battle with a higher level enemy, it decreases the wielder's HP upon landing a critical hit. However, it also applies a damage bonus to his next attack. As for the Waning Blade, it restores HP under the same condition. This makes it clear that the blades really do complement each other. Rokuro then reads that a Fusion Gauge will be filled up after landing several critical strikes. Rokuro can't believe how awesome that is since it means that the blades can fuse together. Rokuro wants to try them right away but sadly finds that he has insufficient stats to equip them. Rokuro calms himself down from the disappointment as he realizes that it's a simple math problem. The required stats are 150 and he is currently at 57. Players get 5 points per level. Rokuro gets really depressed as he realizes that this means he will need to be level 50 before he can use them. The others try to console him but it's no use as he wanted to use his sweet new weapons now. In 3rd Rima, Rokuro arrives late to his meeting with Pencilgon and Katso. They are furious since he isn't just a little late as they have been waiting for 3 hours. Rokuro explains that he was busy with a unique scenario and kept going in it because Weatherman came up. Pencilgon agrees to let him off the hook for being late as long as he reveals any information he received. Katso can't believe it and Rokuro points out how bold Katso is for selecting the blonde girl as his avatar. Katso states that he doesn't need pointers on character design from the guy who looks like a bird and calls him an infamous criminal. Pencilgon intentionally had to pick a place for the meeting that had low traffic because Rokuro has so many people coming after him. Rokuro then catches them up on everything he learned about Weatherman the Tomb Guard. Katso wonders if they are dealing with some kind of undead monster, and Pencilgon recalls that Weatherman's movements did seem a bit janky. 
She assumed he was a cyborg type, but being undead makes more sense. Pencilgon strangely states that she has something to take care of and instructs them to meet later that night. She also instructs them to grind experience in the iron ruins in the meantime, and gives them a fishing rod and a map. The guys have no clue how the items are supposed to help, but Pencilgon reveals that it will all make sense when they get there. Pencilgon prepares to leave, but she notices the strange little bunny on Rakuro's back. She noticed something was strange the second Rakuro walked in and wonders if he really thought that the disguise was really working. Rakuro does his best acting job as he acts clueless to what she is talking about and simply explains that he's just following the latest fashion trend. Pencilgon is then shocked to see that he did manage to fool at least one person as Katsu wonders what the fashion trend is. Pencilgon decides to drop the issue and just leaves. The two guys excitedly get ready to do some grinding, but Rakuro must take a moment to find the safest route. Katsu was all hyped up but gets discouraged since he now has to sneak around too since he is with Rakuro. Emo gets distressed as she reveals to Rakuro that she is getting a serious earache and would like to move around for a bit. Katsu finally realizes that something is off and becomes startled when he sees that Rakuro's equipment is talking. The jig is up so Rakuro lets Emo free and he states that he was just trying to see how long it would take for Katsu to notice. Katsu realizes that it's the NPC from the unique scenario. As he takes a closer look, he wishes he had one, but Rakuro tells him to get his own. The guys finally arrive at the entrance to the ruins and Rakuro explains that he wants to get to level 50 as soon as possible. Katsu reveals that this is his first time in a party and it's actually the first time Rakuro has partied with another player as well. They reach the entrance to the Iron Ruins of Divinity and they both become excited as it clearly has a different vibe than the rest of the game. We get a brief look into the past as our group has a little strategy meeting. Pencilgon explains that at the start of battle, Weathermon activates a skill. It sets the max level of all characters in the area except for him to level 50. The boys are shocked as Weathermon is an insane level 200. This is why their levels don't really matter against him and player skill is key. The guys are still pretty new to the game so they at least need to grind to level 50. Back to the present, the two guys enter the Iron Ruins of Divinity. They search for a hidden area that is perfect for grinding that Pencilgon told them about but it's taking longer than expected to find it. It's like a whole different game compared to outside of the ruins and black panels are sliding around all over the place. Rakuro, always the trash game player, points out that they could probably do some real cool stuff if they glitch out the platforms. Katso knows his friend well and tells him that he needs to wash away all the trash game stuff in his brain. This place reminds Katso of a god tier sci-fi game, but Rakuro just wants to know what level he is. Katso reveals that he's level 25 and Rakuro mocks him for still being in the 20s. Rakuro is level 31, so Katso is quick to point out that they aren't that far apart. Emo unintentionally roasts Katso as she explains that Rakuro is just worried about how weak and frail he is. Just then, Emo warns the boys to be careful as some big thing called the giant suppression dome almost crushes them. It's clearly an enemy, but Katso confidently tells Rakuro to sit this one out. Emo wonders if that's really okay, but Rakuro is confident in his friend's abilities. Katso prepares to fight and explains that no matter how low a level you are, SLF still lets players stand a chance with skill alone. He destroys the drone with just one punch, impressing his teammates. Katsu explains that the red glowing on his hands is a spell that gives bonuses to strength and vitality. More enemies appear, and he goes on to explain that he selected a Spirit Fist user monk. He cannot equip weapons, but in exchange, he can give himself buffs and beat things down with his fists. As for his build, he put most of his stats into HP and Vitality. Katso finishes up destroying the enemies and can tell what Rakuro's build is just by knowing him. Katso guesses that Rakuro is a glass cannon with a strength and agility focus. He is partially right but Rakuro corrects him as he is a luck and agility focused fighter. Little Emil corrects him even further and explains that Rakuro has a Vorpal soul but still nobody knows what that is. They continue on their long journey, following the precise instructions on the map the Pencil Gong gave them. It has them go in several directions and through many rooms. They are all amazed by the person who made the map since it must have required a lot of patience. The final instructions are to jump down a hole, but they pause as they wonder if it's some kind of prank to make them self-end life. 
Kato doesn't want the glass cannon Rikuro to insta-die going down there, so he takes the lead. Emo says that Kato is one brave lady, but Rikuro tries to explain that Kato is actually a guy. Kato tells them to come down, but calls Rikuro a loser while doing so. Rikuro gets furious and jumps down ready to get some revenge. He quickly forgets the insult however, when he sees that they have arrived at the hidden area. According to Pentagon's instructions, they will be able to fish up a monster called the Lifestyle Lake Serpent in the lake. Katzo wonders if they will really be able to catch anything with their puny little rods, but they decide to give it a try. The two friends are super competitive and decide to compete to see who can catch more. Rokuro's father used to take him fishing all the time, so he knows all the tips and tricks. Rokuro quickly gets a bite, but Katzo points out that it probably has more to do with all his luck. Rokuro only manages to get a salmon, but everyone is shocked when Katzo pulls out his giant serpent. The Lifestyle Lake Serpent is a powerful beast, so Rikuro decides that it's time to unveil his new weapon. Kato reminds Rikuro that he's too low of a level to equip the Moon Blades, but Sneaker Rikuro reveals that he had more weapons made. These are called the Empire B Twin Blades. The serpent begins attacking, and Nemo explains to Kato that she had her sister make these blades for Rikuro. A look back shows the little bunny completing the blades made from the Empire Bee Queen material Rokuro brought her. Bylock gets upset when Rokuro almost forgets her name, so he realizes that he might have to manage affection levels with rabbits other than Emil and Vash. Rokuro panics as he starts getting traumatizing flashbacks from a trash game dating simulator. In that dating simulator, he had to balance the affection levels of a bunch of different girls. If he made the slightest mistake, he would get the bad ending where all the girls moved to Italy to apprentice at a pizzeria. His character named Sunraku Picklefish would have his adolescence crushed beneath a pizza stone. Rikuro quickly snaps out of his depression and compliments Bylock on making his new blades. She reveals that his right hand blade has a special attribute. We then watch as he puts it to work against the serpent. The guys do their best against it but they struggle. Their levels are just too low to put more than a scratch on the creature. Rikuro explains that some weapons, skills, spells, and monster attacks have a corrosion attribute. If enough damage is dealt to a certain part of an avatar, it'll cause visible damage and create a weak point there. Bylock explained that his right hand weapon doesn't corrode in the normal way. It infects the part that Rikuro attacks and corrodes it over time, more like a corrosive poison with the corrode attribute building up and warming its way in little by little. If he keeps dealing more corrosive poison with repeated strikes, it breaks through the enemy's debuff resistance and causes the corrosive attribute to show itself faster. Rikuro finally manages to create a weak spot, so Kato focuses all his strength to attack it. They finally manage to hurt the thing, so Emo wants to join the fight. The serpent quickly targets her, and Rikuro can't get to her in time, but Kato jumps in to take the hit instead. Luckily, Katso survives because he built himself like a tank. Katso stuns the serpent, so they all combine their power to attack the beast, and they finally win the fight. The fight was definitely worth it, as it gave a lot of experience, and the boys are already starting to level up. Katso goes up 4 levels and unlocks a bunch of skills. He wonders if he can link the skills, but Rikuro assumes that he's mistaking SLF for a different game. Rikuro doesn't even know what skill linking is, but Katsu is certain it must be possible since SLF is a game all about skills. Katsu explains that he should have learned that in first year, but Rikuro skipped right past that starter town. Katsu then explains that skills with proficiency levels can be linked up at a facility called the Skill Garden. That lets them create new combo skills. Rikuro now realizes why some of his skills were changing names since that just meant that they could now be linked. There is a lot more that can be done at the skill garden, so Rikuro freaks out after not knowing any of it. Katso then mentions subjobs and guilds, which makes him freak out even more since he missed so much from just skipping one little town. Rikuro decides that he won't get anywhere by being depressed and decides to continue grinding. Sometime later, the boys regroup with Pencilgon. She is happy with their progress as Katso is now level 40 and Rikuro is level 42. That's a lot of progress in such a short amount of time, so they are ahead of schedule. Katso tries to explain how little Rikuro knew about stuff, but Rikuro quiets him down. Katso was pretty impressed with Emo's power, and Rikuro reveals that his precious little bunny friend is already level 56. 
They are still pretty pressed for time overall, which is why Pencilgon had to use an expensive tent that doubles as a save point. Pencilgon then reveals that it's time for them to go meet someone, and this hour of night is the only time they can do it. This person is a unique NPC named Setsuna, and they need to speak to her in order to fight Weathermon. Elsewhere in the night, we see this Setsuna person as she sings by a tree. Rokuro and his friends then make their way through the prismatic forest. Pencilgon explains that they have to find a dark spot amongst all the luminescent moss. When they find the spot, she presses on it and it reveals a secret passage. Rokuro is upset that he passed the forest without finding this area, but Pencilgon explains that finding these time-specific hidden areas is luck of the draw. She even just happened to stumble upon this place. Rokuro looks down on those with less luck than him, but Katso takes exception to this stupid face he is making. Pencilgon tells them to stop their little comedy act as they have reached their destination. This place is filled with beautiful flowers, but the team thinks that it's pretty creepy. Singing can be heard nearby, and Katso brings their attention to the singing girl. This girl is transparent, so our bird brain protagonist wonders if it's a bug in this god tier game. Katso pities his trash game loving friend, since his mind always assumes bugs over plot reasons. Pencilgon greets this NPC named Setsuna, and Rikuro takes note of how her clothes don't seem like they belong in a fantasy world. He wonders if she is from the setting's age of antiquity, the divinity. If so, she could hold the key to the unique scenario that he unlocked. Rikuro decides to introduce himself, painting himself as a man of a hundred skills, but Pencilgon interrupts him and introduces her friends as Stooge 1 and Stooge 2. They are her ace in the hole to finally put Weathermon to rest. Emil and Katso give their names, but Rikuro wants another shot at his introduction. Pencilgon admits that her new team doesn't seem like much now, but she plans to train them up before the battle. This ghost lady then says some surprising stuff, as she has never met someone with Tsuri's presence applied twice, when referring to Rikuro. On top of that, he is also accompanied by Cinderella's child. Rikuro has no clue what she is talking about, but Satsuna just says that he reminds her of someone she used to know a long time ago. She thanks him for reviving some long lost memories, but Rikuro is still completely lost. It's time to get down to business though, so a screen pops up, prompting them to begin a new unique scenario. The guys accept, so Satsuna reveals that Weatherman was her dearest love. They had a minor misunderstanding, and she passed away. Since then, all Weatherman has done his entire life is guard her grave. Satsuna has no clue how much time has passed since then, but the next thing she knew, she was in this ghost-like state. Satsuna feels no resentment about the way her life ended, but she believes that things that end should lie in the past. They shouldn't tie down someone's present or their future. She can't stand knowing that Weatherman remains tied down to her past. Weatherman used the spell she created to create a barrier around her grave, and did some other complicated stuff to make it impossible for anyone to reach its location. However, on the night of a new moon, when the moon loses all its light, a crack forms in the barrier. Kato puts it pretty bluntly and determines that all they have to do is jump through this crack and fight Weathermon. Setsuna has told them everything and just wishes that they will finally be able to put him to rest. Pencilgon tells her that they are nothing like the losers who tried before and assures her that they will put an end to all this suffering. Rikuro and Katsu are stunned since this pencil gun is nothing like the pencil gun they know. The pencil gun they know once dragged an NPC king behind her carriage in order to lure her enemies. She is also the pencil gun that tied an NPC princess to a chandelier to bait players into trying to rescue her. The fact that she is having a pleasant conversation with an NPC right now is unbelievable to them. They mockingly wonder if she has developed some kind of soul, but Pencilgon makes them pay the price for laughing at her. Pencilgon wishes she could PK them a bunch of times, but they don't have time as they must prepare for the fight with Weathermon. Pencilgon reveals that she does like to play the game straight sometimes. Something about Setsuna and her story has her invested. Pencilgon seems almost ashamed when she admits to this, but Rikuro thinks it's totally fine. Getting serious about a game is a great thing in his eyes, since everything is more fun when a person takes it seriously. Kato completely agrees and points out that it's pretty much his job since he is a pro gamer. Rikuro is always looking for a way to mock his friend, so he points out that Kato is a pro gamer, but he still hasn't found a single unique thing for himself and SLF. 
The guys begin fighting and are only stopped when Pencilgon laughs at them for reminding her that they are just as stupid as she is. Pencilgon then gets serious and reminds them that they are facing a monster that forces players to level down to level 50. That is something unprecedented in boss battle history, but she is confident that they can beat him. They all agree to take their mission seriously and join hands. Sometime later, Rakuro wakes up and explains that he has been grinding extremely hard ever since he met Setsuna. Every day, he has been having late nights. He has finally managed to reach level 51 and Kato is at level 46. Now he needs to work on his skills and Nemo told them that there was a skill garden for linking skills in Rabatuza. Rikuro remembers how Pencilgon told them that this fight will depend completely on their skills, so he is determined to improve them. Rikuro is then greeted by his mother, Eika, who is glad that he has been keeping up with their agreement over summer break. Rokuro points out that he didn't really have a choice since he didn't want her physically logging him out of his game anymore. Rokuro's younger sister Rumi is really upset about their mother keeping her pet bugs in the kitchen and notices that Rokuro is checking out one of the models in her magazine. The model's name is Toa and according to Rumi, she is the greatest model to ever exist. This Toa name has something to do with the Setsuna name and we learn that Pencilgon is actually Toa. Rumi explains that she has been doing some part-time modeling herself, but she will have to ask their dad to get some more publicity. Their father just so happens to return home, and he shows off the gigantic fish that he caught. His name is Shenji, and his kids are disappointed that they will have to eat fish for every meal again for a while. In their household, they have an agreement, a bit of a rule. For breakfast and dinner on Sundays, they have to eat and talk together as a family. This rule was necessary, since if it didn't exist, then they would all get lost in their own hobbies and never see each other. Shenji needs to clean the fish as soon as possible, but Rumi desperately tells him to do it in the kitchen. Rokuro is sure that they might seem weird to the outside world, but he thinks his family has just found out a way to make things work for themselves. Rokuro then decides that it's time to head back into SLF, as there are only two weeks left until the battle with Weathermon. It will definitely be a difficult fight, especially after the information that Pencilgon gave him. Weathermon is a non-stop source of single-digit frame attacks, instant death moves, and area attacks. However, this information made him realize where the perfect place to practice will be. The trash game where constant glitches make all attacks come at crazy speed. The game is called Berserk Online Passion. Rokuro enters this game, also known as Burp, and points out how it's always so deserted. No one is even there, so Rikuro decides that he will just fight the final boss of the story mode. Just then, he runs into a random player named Dragonfly. This kid is really eager for a fight and explains that he is still new to the game. He hasn't even beat the final boss yet and would love if Rikuro could give him some tips. This game is pretty old, so Rikuro can't believe this kid is a new player and even calls him an endangered species. Rikuro acknowledges that this fight won't be the best for his training but he can't pass up an opportunity to fight such a rare specimen. This is of course a trash game, so they agree that glitches can be used in their fight. Rikuro analyzes this kid and determines that he has an all-around build. This is a type that generates a lot of glitches, but Rikuro assumes that he won't know how to use them. The battle starts, but Rikuro is instantly shocked when Dragonfly charges in. Rikuro reminds himself that this kid is a beginner, so he probably won't be using typical strategies. Rikuro is then surprised even further when this kid draws his fist back just before unleashing the punch motion. This is a technique that allows a player to generate a bug that extends their arm like rubber. If the hit lands, it deals a two-hit combo with double the damage. Its name is Pile Bunker, and Dragonfly is shocked to see that he missed. Rikuro explains that he used a bug move called Yo-Yo, and it throws off a player's avatar texture and hitbox instantly. Rikuro acknowledges that this kid can use some basic bugs, but he explains that there is way more to this game than that. Burp is filled with bugs that players have discovered through trial and research, and he plans to give this kid a full demonstration. Rikuro's fight against Dragonfly draws a crowd, and they all wonder if Dragonfly is really a new player. It's hard to believe because this kid is taking on the famous Rikuro, and he is determined to win at least one round. Rikuro just thrashes the kid around like he's Luffy with his Gatling punch, and Dragonfly loses yet another round. Rikuro reveals that his awesome quick draw fist fighting style is basically unbeatable, but Dragonfly wants one more try. It'll be the best of three, and they both once again agree to an all-out bug-filled battle. 
where Kuro's disappointed to see this dumb kid use the same exact approach again, but this time Dragonfly shocks him with a dodge. Rokuro is impressed that this dude learned to time the yo-yo glitch with his opponent's attacks, and the kid is glad to be learning from him. Rokuro thinks that's nice and all, but he was supposed to be training in preparation for the fight against Weathermon, and he wishes he was fighting a stronger opponent. Dragonfly can tell he's distracted, and uses the opportunity to shock Rokuro with a powerful attack. Rokuro's really impressed this time, as the kid was able to close in with the retraction of his glitched out leg, and use the momentum to attack. Rekuro already knows this attack well though, and it's called the Flying Smash. He explains that Dragonfly's use of the attack shows just how little he knows about this game. Flying Smash is a powerful move, but it leaves the user with a really long recovery time. Rekuro then demonstrates the move he should have used, called the Pile Bunker. It's an absolute assault with the fists, and Rekuro pushes Dragonfly back with it. With escape definitely not being an option, Dragonfly decides to just charge right in face first but Rekuro simply plans to counter it with a quick draw. Dragonfly uses some kind of glitch, but none of the other players can tell what he is doing. This kid's avatar is really spazzing out, and Rekuro is shocked to see that this kid triggered two flying smashes at once. Rekuro's never seen that before, but he is pretty sure that his quick draw could still counter it. He decides to let it hit him though, and everyone is shocked as Dragonfly finally wins a round. Onlooker still can't understand what they saw, but Dragonfly still celebrates his accomplishment. All the nerds that play this burp game religiously get together and discuss the move that Dragonfly just used. Both fists somehow had hitboxes and it allowed Dragonfly to stack gauge moves. They compare it to other known glitch attacks, but it doesn't match any of them. They determine that if a test team can reproduce Dragonfly's attack, then it will make it official. For now though, Rekuro surprisingly congratulates Dragonfly for unofficially discovering a new bugged out move. Dragonfly is at a complete loss for words, but this is a big deal to the nerd squad, and they bestow Dragonfly with the honor of naming the bug move. Dragonfly racks his brain thinking of a name, but Rekuro tells him to take his time, especially since they have more rounds to play. Rekuro decides that in exchange for Dragonfly showing him a new move, he will show him one as well. It's a pretty crazy bug that can only be activated the instant the round starts though. Round 2 starts soon after, and Rekuro shockingly uses the bug move called Doppelganger. It splits Rekuro in two, and Rekuro reveals that he struggled to pick a name for it when he discovered the bug move. He explains that what makes this game so special is that just when you think you have it all figured out, there's always new things to learn. That is why, no matter how many people desert the game, he always drops in from time to time. Rekuro attacks with his doppelganger as Dragonfly counters, but we quickly find that Dragonfly just lost two rounds in a row. He thinks it was unfair that Rekuro's clone held him while Rekuro destroyed him, but that's just part of the game. Rekuro acknowledges though that the attack does get a bit crazy, since the clone ends up getting controlled by AI if he lets it. Dragonfly is gracious in his defeat, as he thanks Rekuro for giving his time to a loser newbie like him. He vows to think of a cool name for his bug move, but let's all hope he thinks of something better than doppelganger attack. Rekuro then reveals that there is one really creepy bug a friend of his found. Rekuro isn't even sure if he can do it, but Dragonfly is eager to let Rekuro try it out on him. This friend he is talking about is of course Katsu, and we get a glimpse of what he is up to. Katsu is furious that Rekuro left him alone with the crazy pencil gone, and she demands that he shut up and keep training. Back in Rabatuza, Rekuro is excited to have returned to SLF and is ready to spend his entire day playing it. He is accompanied of course by the loyal Emil, and he tells her that the plan for today is to try out the skill combo stuff Katsu told him about. Rekuro wonders if they're even going the right way, but Emil can't believe that this dum dum started running off without even knowing where the skill garden was. More importantly though, Emil is shocked to see Rekuro so energized since he was extremely exhausted just the night before. The birdface explains that the switch is simple, and it's because discovering new things gets him excited. Emo points him in the correct direction of the skill garden, and reveals that the one they are going to in Rabatuza has a far greater selection than the ones in Towns. It's a secret though, so the secret of Little Bunny wants the stupid bird to keep it that way. Rekuro is more than willing to have a secret advantage, so he agrees. They finally arrive at this very hyped up skill garden, where they are greeted by another bunny. Her name is Elk, and she is glad to see Emo with her birdman friend. Rekuro comes to the realization that he will never be able to escape the constant bird names, but he really just brought that on himself. Emo reveals that Elk is her big sister, and they are two of a set of triplets. Rekuro can sort of see the resemblance in the two pink bunnies, and wonders how she could have so many siblings. 
Rokuro explains his intention to combine skills there, and Elk thankfully reveals that she is very good at that sort of thing. That is why her father put her in charge of it, and why she is there now. Rokuro mocks her like a jerk by repeating her speech pattern for some reason, and asks for her to show him how to combine his skills. Despite this strange bird brain behavior, Elk agrees to do it. Rokuro reveals that he has been jumping levels rapidly, so his skills have really piled up. His list of linkable skills is a long one, and he explains that a bunch of them have changed too. Elk reveals that combining high level skills does tend to produce superior skills in the end, compared to combining those same skills at a lower level. Rokuro begins to wonder if he should max the skills out first, but ultimately decides that he wants to clean up his skill list by combining them. Moments later we see that he finishes up deciding which skill combinations he wants to make. Rokuro pays for the so called recipe, and Elk heads off to work on it. While she does that, our bird hero decides to double check his stats. He is level 51 now, but he had to stat up to equip his moon blades, so he never got the chance to increase his vitality. He is more of a glass cannon than ever before, and his defenses are still paper thin. Elk announces that she is finished, and Rokuro is shocked when he sees what she brought out. Elk explains that it's 6 combinations at once, so the amount is a bit overboard. However, the moment Rokuro drinks it all down, he will learn the combined skills instantly. This thing looks super toxic though, and Rokuro can't believe he has to chug this foul liquid. There's even a freaking branch in this thing, and he thinks about how he would never do it if he weren't in a game. He is in a game though, so the rabbits tell him to stop being a wuss and chug. Rokuro pours the stuff down his giant bird beak, and the girls watch in admiration. Rokuro finally finishes up the disgusting liquid, and is amazed by the result. He learned all the skills instantly just like she said, and he now has 6 new skills from the ones he linked. Plus 9 he learned or that changed while he leveled up. He hopes at least one of them is really powerful, and his little bunny friends congratulate him. Elk is a great sales rabbit, and quickly upsells him. She reveals that there are skill grimoires that players can only acquire in Rabbitooza. As if that sales pitch wasn't good enough, Elk gives him a discount for being friends with Emil. Emil realizes what's going on and tries to warn Rokuro that her sister's really greedy. Elk quickly silences her sister from exposing her money hungry nature, but Rokuro tells his little bunny friend not to fear. When it comes to merch a player can only buy in special areas like Rabatuza, he's always prepared to pay some high prices. That's music to Elk's ears, and like a true greedy salesperson, she starts the negotiations off by asking him how much he is willing to spend. Rokuro reveals that he has 80,000 to spend, so the little gold digging rabbit shows him what she has for around that price. Rokuro doesn't seem to understand what is happening here, as he is stunned to see that all this stuff costs at least 30,000, even with the discount applied. It took forever, but Rokuro finally wonders if she's trying to rip him off. Elk is an experienced professional, and instantly pressures our boy by wondering if he's really going to be a fool and let this special offer go to waste. Rokuro's weak bird brain caves to the pressure, and agrees to buy a couple things. Afterwards our boy is broker than an anime recap viewer, and he laments how he can't afford some waste armor he wanted to buy. Now he will have to make some more money before the weathermon fight. Just then Rokuro realizes that he has to meet with his teammates, so the always useful email opens a gate. At the meeting, Pencil Gun is glad to see that they are on time for once. She seems to be in a better mood than usual, and it's because she has made a decision regarding their battle against Weathermon that will be in two weeks. There is one problem though. Her clan, Ashurakai, are the only other ones that know about the conditions that need to be met in order to face off against Weathermon. They have been using the unique monster system that allows players to gain experience just for encountering these unique monsters to level up and build their PvP skills. Before Pencilgon can reveal the problem, Rikuro already knows. On the night they fight Weathermon, it is very likely that they will end up encountering members of Ashura Kai. Katso wonders why Pencilgon can't just work something out with them, pointing out that she is part of the clan. Pencilgon reveals that it's impossible, since the Ashura Kai actively opposed the idea of defeating Weathermon. Rikuro doesn't understand what she made her mind up about, so Pencilgon finally reveals what she meant. Ashura Kai are universally hated for their player killing ways, and there was recently an update that gives players who have done player killing a special sort of status. If a normal player kills a player killer, they will receive a bounty. More importantly, this player will also earn the right to any items and equipment the PK was carrying. Every single thing, including things they have in storage. High level PKers like the ones in Ashura Kai tend to end up with some pretty rare items, which basically makes them walking treasure chests. This created a new class of player, the PK Killer. 
The Shurikai found loopholes in the system to reduce the damage these PK killers could do to them. However, someone could get around all of that by attacking their hideout. The guys are shocked as they see where she is going with this and realize what she made her mind up about. Pentagon is part of the Ashura Kai, so she knows exactly where their hideout is, and she explains that that gang of cowards had just become a thorn in her side at this point. For that reason, she was thinking that they should go squash the Ashura Kai. A glimpse two weeks into the future shows that Shangri-La Frontier will be getting a summer update. This will also be the exact day our heroes fight Weatherman the Tomb Guard, and we watch as the update is completed. On the day of the update, some people are shocked to find that all the resurrection items in several different towns have been bought up by someone. Their leader, who is currently meeting with other guild leaders, will surely be mad at them, and we see that Pencilgon is responsible for buying up all the resurrection items. Elsewhere, side character Yamamoto explains to side character Maya that a new area has been unlocked. A new scenario and job got added, and there has been some balance adjustments to some monster stats. This crazy girl is excited for the update, but she just wonders if there are new weapons so she can keep killing things, and hopes for a bigger and better weapon. Luckily for this psycho, she hears a strange noise, so she plans to eliminate all the monsters around her. Yamamoto stops her as these are all just normal people, but she explains that she heard a monster breathing. This breathing was actually just another crazy person like her. It's Rei and she is panicking as she plans to send Rikuro a message that she has been trying to write for some time now. She plans to invite him to her party, and the day of the update is the perfect time to do it. Rei wants to send it before Rikuro logs out of the game, but she's too much of a coward. After some more panicking, Rei finally sends the message to the bird using another bird, and she calms herself down by reminding herself that she spent two weeks writing that letter. Another messenger bird arrives to deliver a message from her guild leader, who is also her sister named Momo. The location of Ashura Kai's hideout has been leaked by someone, so she tells Rei to join her. Elsewhere, the bunny and the bird enjoy a drink, and Rikuro upsets her by calling her his old lady. The sad day for them to part ways has come, so Emo has something to give the bird brain. Before she can though, Rikuro fights one of his own as the messenger bird arrives, and he fears that the toxic poop bird has come for revenge. The bird on bird violence eventually stops, and Rikuro surprised to see that the game's internal letter system has brought him a letter from Siger Zero. For a letter Ray spent a lot of time on, it ended up sounding way too formal. It is very direct and to the point, however, as she asks Rikuro to join her so they can explore the new update together. Her writing is so formal that Rikuro thought she was challenging him to a duel. Rikuro prepares to deny her since he is too busy today, but another messenger bird arrives. Emo wants to take this one down before it can hurt Rikuro, but Rikuro comes to the defense of one of his bird brothers. This second message is also from Siger Zero, but this time she reveals that an urgent matter has come up, and she can no longer accompany Rikuro. Rikuro is actually relieved and excited to buy some things in preparation for his coming battle. Just then, Vash appears and admires the determined look Rikuro has in his eyes. Vash encourages our boy and tells him to send that fool who's outlived his time to his final rest. Emil finally gets the chance to give him his gift, which is something her father originally bought her. It is an amulet of protection. Rikuro is so confident that he doesn't think he will need it, but on top of his already powerful skills, it will make things even more awesome. Emil puts the necklace on her bird-faced companion and declares that she will wait for his speedy return. At his house, Rikuro's sister sees a sign on his door that says that he is taking care of important business, and he is not to be disturbed. Inside his room, we see that this gaming addict has returned to the game after a short break. It's finally time for them to initiate their plan, and it begins at Ashurakai's hideout. Ashurakai's leader named Orsalot is getting impatient waiting for Pencilgon, and eventually decides to go to the hidden garden without her. However, just then, Sagar Zero absolutely destroys one of them. Everyone is shocked by the legendary attack master, and Momo declares that this will finally be the end of Ashura Kai. The Ashura Kai think that only one clan has come for them, but it soon becomes clear that there are actually many. Orsala can't believe that they formed an alliance to take them down, and he wonders what's going on. Sagar Zero is busy taking dudes out, and she tells them that this is payback for all the players they bullied. All the clans descend on the hideout, so Orsala tells everyone in his clan to retreat to the hidden garden. As Orsalot makes his escape, he wonders who leaked the location of their hideout. Elsewhere, Rikuro shows off his awesome new equipment that is actually just a sash. It doesn't look like much, but it skyrockets his vitality all the way from 7 to 22. 
Kato points out that it's like paper-thin armor, but that's just Rakuro's glass cannon style. Our boy Rakuro's all jacked up on energy drinks, so he thanks Kato for recommending a new brand. Just then, Pencil Gun arrives and reveals that the first part of their plan went so perfectly that it was boring. Siger Zero seemed amped, as if she was upset about something. Rakuro uses his bird brain to put two and two together and realizes that she must be upset about having to cancel her plans to party up with him. Katsu points out that the Ashurakai are going to want to destroy Pencil Gun if they figure out that she was the one that leaked their location. Pencil Gun isn't worried though, since she will just have to beat them first, and the guys join Pencil Gun's party. As the Ashurakai run to safety, they begin to wonder if there was a spy in their group. Orcelot begins to think of who would do such a thing, but they are shocked to find that the entrance to the hidden garden is sealed off because someone is already inside. Orcelot uses all the signs and realizes what happened. He becomes enraged and reveals that the traitor is his sister Pencilgon. Inside, Pencilgon thinks she heard the cries of a sore loser crybaby, but determines that it must have just been her imagination. Our heroes have just gone over the plan one last time, so they are ready to fight. Rokuro points out that Satsun is not there today, but Pentagon explains that she can't be seen without the light of the full moon. They set out to begin, and Pentagon vows not to let Satsuna's memories be bad ones. She promises to make her dream come true, and they go through a portal. They arrive in a mysterious place, and Satsuna's voice can be heard singing. Weatherman the Tomb Guard sits by a tree, and his ability activates, changing everyone's level to 50. Of course our group was prepared for this, so Weatherman prepares himself as well. Pencilgon has Rakuro start their strategy off, so he walks right up to the menacing looking samurai. Rakuro tells this guy that he wants to have a good fight, but this unique monster doesn't say a single word to him and just attacks. Rakuro dodges his wind slash and instantly uses a skill called Infight. Rakuro lands a kick and declares that he's going to test the limits of this robo samurai. Rakuro's caught off guard by how effective this thing's upward slash is, and he uses his new daggers to keep an attack from slicing his head off. Rakuro can see right through him as he knows that Weatherman is targeting his head. Rakuro's teammates watch and Pentagon is amazed that Rakuro was able to get the timing of Weatherman's attacks on the first try. A look back shows that Pentagon prepared them for Weatherman's wind slash. It's a quick draw move believed to have a single frame execution. It also has a guard pierce effect so Rakuro either needs to see it coming and evade or counter it. Asking him to time it perfectly on the first try was asking a lot already, but Pentagon also revealed that Weatherman has a whole bunch of other, even nastier skills. She then explains that Weatherman is most likely a special condition type. This is an enemy that a player does not beat by reducing their HP to zero. Instead, they are defeated when a certain condition is achieved. They don't know what condition though, so they go over some possibilities. Some common ones require that players last a certain length of time, or survive a particular attack. Others require a player to pick up or destroy a certain in-game object. Rakuro has even heard of a condition that requires players to reason with their target in middle of battle. Pencil Gun explains that she has already tested a few conditions, but she thinks it might be the one that requires them to last a certain length of time. As they continue to just watch Rakuro fight, Pencil Gun goes over their plan. She explains that Weatherman's combat conditions change as time passes. First, they need to survive the 10 minutes of Phase 1. Rakuro does well to match Weatherman, and Pencilgan explains that Rakuro will be the key to surviving the first phase. Rakuro is really towing the line, as he couldn't be any more of a glass cannon, and he's just barely managing to dodge Weatherman's attacks. Pencilgan shows a lot of confidence in our boy though, since he has the skills of a pro gamer, and she is certain that he can figure out the way through Weatherman's attacks. Katsu is no slouch either, as he is an actual professional gamer, and he carefully studies the fight. This kid is so serious that he talks to himself and breaks down every single move Weatherman makes. Pencilgon realizes that she picked the absolute most perfect teammates. She declares that with them by her side, she can bet everything on this battle, and she pulls out some old school scale. Rikuro pushes the unique beast just like he promised he would, and he has come to realize that it has some seriously tough armor. Rakuro fails to sweep its leg, and he points out that there isn't a single attack that phases this guy. However, on the flip side, Rakuro would instantly die if any of Weatherman's attacks hit him. Katsu's studying proves useful, as he's able to predict Weatherman's next wind slash, but our boy Rakuro already knows that Weatherman is not someone that can be beaten. Weatherman uses his wind slash, and everyone is shocked as it lands a deadly blow on Rakuro. 
Rokuro's HP drops to zero, but Pencilgon has Katso use a revive item on him. This thing works quickly, and Rokuro comes back to life. A look to just before the fight shows when Pencilgon gave the guys rebirth tier jewels. They are resurrection items, and if they are used on a disabled player within 10 seconds, they are revived with full HP. Pencilgon went from town to town and bought all 12 that were for sale. She tells the guys to use them carefully and reveals that they cost 4 million units apiece. Each of them will get 4 each, but she has another item. It's called Divine Life Salve and it revives a player with half HP. They each get 5 of those and Pencilgun explains that that's the max number of extra lives players can get in the game. That's 27 resurrections in total and it's all to challenge Weathermon. They decided that Rokuro would lead the charge and one of them would revive him if he gets eliminated. Whoever is alive will fight off Weathermon in the meantime and they will continue rotating. They just need to survive long enough to win, so Pentagon calls her strategy Zombie Tactics. Back to their present, Rokuro gets revived with full health. Weathermon turns his attention to Katso, so he takes over, keeping the monster busy. Katso wonders what Rokuro learned from fighting him, so he explains that they can't beat him and Katso just needs to focus on dodging. Pencilgon is timing them and reveals that Rokuro lasted 2 minutes and 50 seconds, a record for a first timer. She is pretty impressed and wonders what he thinks about their opponent. Rokuro concedes that there's definitely no way he could keep pace with Weathermon. This monster definitely belongs in the 7 Colossi League with the Lycagon. Pencilgon reminds him that she spent a lot of money on this plan of hers, so she wants Rokuro to make it worthwhile. Rokuro checks on his weapons and is shocked to find that their durability is already down to half after just 2 minutes of fighting. Luckily, Rokuro raised the durability of another weapon to the extreme. These are his marsh daggers and he reiterates that this fight against Weathermon is one of endurance. Rokuro tags back in for Katso, but his attack doesn't do a single thing. Rokuro didn't expect it to work, but he realizes that he is in trouble when Weathermon prepares his next attack. It's a thunderclap, but Rokuro uses his skatefoot ability to avoid all the lightning strikes. The others have to dodge as well, and Pencilgon explains that the thunderclap calls down a barrage of insta-kill lightning strikes. Rokuro has gotten the hang of the skatefoot ability, and he can stay ahead of the attacks as long as he keeps running at full speed. Weathermon uses his Nimbus Fist, however, and Rokuro has no clue what to do about it. The fist attack is so powerful that Rokuro dies again, but Katso's right there to revive him again. Katso takes over, but Weathermon proves to be too much for him as well. Pencilgon revives him, so Rokuro tags back in. Weathermon just instantly kills Rokuro again, so Pencilgon revives him, and she does something to her little scale. After Katso gets revived for a second time, he determines that it's impossible to dodge this guy's attacks, and they would be lucky to survive for 30 seconds. Pencilgon remains calm as she compliments them for doing a good job, and explains that they still have half of their resurrection items left. Katso of course wonders what Pencilgon is doing, but she simply states that she is preparing something. Just then, Weathermon surprisingly stops, and Pencilgon explains that 10 minutes have passed. It's time for phase 2, so Weathermon summons his tactical support named Kirin. Rokuro is amazed when a magic circle appears, but Pencilgon tells Katso that it's time. Katso is glad that his time as resurrection backup is over, and he prepares for battle. Their research before the fight revealed that when you fight Weathermon for 10 minutes, he summons his robot horse. Kirin finally appears, but Katso is stunned since this thing is more like a giant dump truck with legs. Katso dodges the giant robot horse's first attack and runs for his life. Phase 2 requires that they survive for another 10 minutes, but this time they cannot let Weathermon combine with Kirin. Pentagon tells Katso that he can't just be on the defensive since Kirin will just start using its huge arsenal of attacks. On top of that, if it combines with Weathermon, there will be no way to stop them from trampling them. The only way to prevent that is to stay on the horse's back long enough to trigger its buck off animation. Kirin begins to launch its missiles and Katso has no clue how to mount the beast since he isn't a cowboy. Pentagon reminds him of a popular mount fighting game, but Rokuro has never heard of a trash game with that name. Rokuro is reminded to focus on his own fight, and Katso explains that the mount fighting game was actually a god tier game. SLF is a god tier game too, and it puts a lot of care into its world building. Looking into that usually leads to a solution. This makes Katso realize that since Kirin is a machine, it will need maintenance. 
Kato uses this knowledge to find his maintenance ladder, so he mounts the horse and uses a whip to help stay on. Kato channels his skills from the mount fighting game and does his best to hold on while the horse bucks wildly. Things seem to be going well, but Pentagon is concerned. They are running out of resurrection items, so she will have to use the reward scale. By sacrificing items to the left side offering dish, a player can receive various perks from the right side blessing dish. This is an incredibly rare item, so Pentagon had to persuade some very powerful people to let her borrow it. To make the best use of the scale, Pentagon sold all her high value items that she has gotten while playing SLF. She now has an insane 30 million gold and she offers it to the scale. In return, Pentagon selects the perk that gives more stat points. Rekuro isn't doing so well as he is barely managing to survive and he is running out of stamina. Katsu is doing even worse as the horse is tossing him around like a rag doll. The golden scale does its thing as it must maintain equilibrium and it grants Pentagon the temporary ability to award additional stat points to other players. The rate is 1 point per 100,000 gold so her life savings gives them 300 points in total. Pentagon starts off by giving them 50 points each and Rekuro can instantly feel the difference. He realizes that Pentagon is behind this and notices that she boosted his stamina and luck. Rekuro tells Weathermon that he knows he can't damage him, but he has another plan. Rekuro puts his daggers away and uses a skill called Infight. Rekuro has experience fighting opponents he can't damage, but he has a secret weapon. There is a combat skill that doesn't pull from strength, and instead it pulls from luck. This skill is called Hand Fortune. Weathermon tries to attack, but it's too late, as Rekuro's lucky punch knocks his sword away. Rekuro does a bit of taunting, then rushes to grab Weathermon's sword. This sword is way too big to fit into Rekuro's inventory, but at least Weathermon won't be able to use his quick slash or lightning strike attack. That Nimbus punch will still be a problem, but Rekuro knows he can avoid it as long as he stays behind Weathermon. The stat increase didn't help Kato too much, but Pentagon tells him that he just needs to hold on for 4 more minutes. Kirin manages to launch Katso across the arena, but he gets an idea. Rekuro is distracted by the chaos and gets surprised by Weathermon who uses an attack called Tidal Rush. Rekuro manages to dodge it, but the attack was so powerful that he is certain that it's an insta-kill ability. He realizes that Weathermon must have a special move set for when his sword is taken, but Rekuro notices that he just made a mistake. He ran in the wrong direction and put Pentagon right between him and Weathermon. Pentagon ends up taking Weathermon's aggro, but Rekuro appears at the last second to get the aggro back. Weathermon takes a hold of him though and smashes him with Tidal Rush. Rekuro needs to be revived again quickly, but Weathermon has his sword again and uses his Nimbus Fist. Pentagon just manages to make it in the safe zone behind Weathermon and she revives Rekuro just in time. The sword fight resumes but Pentagon explains that one more death could ruin their chances of success. Rekuro determines that it's better if Weathermon has his sword since he's already familiar with the sword attack animations. There is just one minute left and we see that Katso's plan was a crazy one. This insane kid decided to tie himself to Kirin's face and Pentagon can't believe what she is seeing. Katso thinks he might actually be losing HP from getting tossed around, but Pentagon tells him to hold on as time is almost up. Just then, phase 2 ends and Weathermon shockingly drops to his knees. This would normally seem like a good sign, but Rekuro isn't getting you beat me vibes from Weathermon. Weathermon's armor begins to crack and Pentagon tells the guys to stay on guard. She explains that even when a Shurikai fought at full strength, they only managed to get this far one time. This means that phase 2 is now over and the real challenge begins. The last time Pentagon witnessed phase 3, Weathermon wiped out all of a Shurikai with his first move. When the cracks formed in his armor, Weathermon let out a howl and unleashed a shockwave across the entire field. When it hit them, none of their buffs or armor mattered, they all died instantly. Rekuro isn't looking forward to that at all, but he can tell that Pentagon has a plan. She does, but Pentagon states that if it doesn't work, then they need to dodge the best they can. She points out that in SLF, the keys to victory come from the story. Pentagon always assumed that Weathermon was a cyborg who modified his body with technology. However, Vash gave them a clue to what he really is. He mentioned that Weathermon was a living corpse who outlived his time. This means that what Weathermon must actually be classified as is an undead monster. Pentagon launches a bottle at him and reveals what is needed to fight against the undead. It's holy water, but it's also special. It's the holy water of a saint 
and it's the best potion anyone can get for fighting the undead. The holy water quickly takes effect, and Weatherman lets out a ferocious howl. Pentelgon is shocked as this isn't the animation for when Weathermon uses his field attack. This is actually great news, as it means she managed to cancel it with the holy water. Rikuro thinks it's weird that she splooshed all over him with the saint's water, but Pentagon says that the saint is like an idol in SLF. Katso wonders what's going on with Weathermon, but he gets startled when the horse begins to transform. It turns into some kind of mech, but Pentelgon has never seen it before. She wonders if it's an exclusive new form for Stage 3, and realizes that they just can't let it combine with Weathermon. Katso must go back to running for his life, and Rikuro points out that a new form means they need a new approach. Weathermon's body is gradually crumbling. In Phase 1 and 2, they needed to hold on for 10 minutes. However, for Phase 3, Rikuro wonders if they have to hold out until Weathermon completely falls apart. Rikuro instructs Pencilgon to go help Katso, and he guarantees that he can survive until Weathermon crumbles. Pencilgon agrees, but tells him not to be too reckless. Helping Katso means she won't be able to act as support, so one death could spell the end for Rikuro. Pencilgon wishes him luck and heads off. Rikuro prepares for battle, but apologizes to Pencilgon in his mind. Ever since she mentioned the thing about hanging in there through the time limit, he has been thinking about something. As he dodges an attack, Rikuro wonders where the fun is in just holding out. Rikuro doesn't like the idea of a boss that makes you just turtle up and hide for 30 minutes. He has already played a ton of games that put storyline first. Games that go for a balance between fiction and gameplay and fail are regularly given the trash game stamp. Shangri-La Frontier should be different though, since it's a god tier game. Rikuro's next attack gets blocked, but he realizes something. In this form, Weathermon might actually take damage. Rikuro believes that SLF created a compromise between the fiction and the gameplay. Any player who endures those first 20 minutes gets a reward, which is a turn to fight back. Rikuro then shockingly changes his mask for the first time, and his weapons as well. His helmet is the new armor that was made from quad beetle materials. Rikuro decides to stray from the plan as he declares that he will defeat Weathermon before he gets a chance to fall apart. Rikuro uses his new helmet to block Weathermon's attack and he explains that he practiced parrying with it a lot. Rikuro says that parrying with the helmet leaves his hands free to attack and he lands a strike on Weathermon. Rikuro's disappointed though since he landed a critical hit but Weathermon doesn't seem phased at all. Rikuro gave a bunch of money to the greedy bunny to prepare for this fight so he plans to use what he got to rub Weathermon's face in the dirt. Rikuro then uses a skill called Moon's Reflection to hit Weathermon from behind. That was actually a bluff though, and Rikuro uses his Assassin Pierce to strike Weathermon again. He follows that up with Drill Pierce, and Weathermon falls to his knees. Swords on the back are a swordsman's greatest shame, so Rikuro apologizes as he plans to deal Weathermon a whole bunch of shame. Rikuro laughs like a maniac, and Pentagon knew he would somehow end up in a brawl. Kato notices that he is cackling like a maniac, but Pentagon points out that it's a good sign. The more of an underdog Rikuro is, the more his motivation and player skill spike. However, they have no chance of winning if they can't hold back Kirin. Kato explains that he landed some punches, and it looks like Kirin can take damage now. That's great and all, but Pencilgon just wants them to stay alive so they can draw Kirin's aggro away from Rikuro. She wants them to do good enough to just get a passing grade, but Kato has other ideas. He attacks Kirin and explains that if he's going to get graded, then he wants a perfect score. Unfortunately, Kato just ends up getting destroyed, and Pentagon must revive him. Kato rethinks his plan, and sees that Pentagon also gave him something called Evil Force. It increases the user's stats for 15 minutes, and it should give him abilities on par with level 99. She didn't give it to them before though, because it comes with a serious penalty. Things aren't going too well, and Pentagon is getting pretty tired of the one-sided fight just like the boys are. Katso wanted a perfect score, so Pentagon is certain that he's prepared for the penalty. Katso doesn't even wait to hear what it is, and instantly eats the evil force thing. Katso's vision changes, and even sounds different. Pentagon explains that evil force will also mess with his sense of smell and taste. Katso doesn't think the penalty's that bad, but Pentagon explains that that's not the bad part. The bad part is that his level will decrease by 1 every 30 seconds. Katso is stunned since it will go on for 15 minutes, and the effects will last even after the fight. When the fight ends, he will have to start over from level 20. Katso wishes she would have told him sooner, but he just didn't give her enough time. The happy-go-lucky Pencilgon then uses her scale to boost her own stats some more, 
and Ketzel decides to get serious. He combines his black and crimson attacks to create a combo spirit fist. Pentagon maxes out her buffs and they attack Kirin. Ketzel creates a cross-shaped seal with his left fist and smashes it with a punch from his right. With Kirin finally staggered, Pentagon plans to stab its knee until it shatters. She manages to do damage, but is shocked that she still can't even crack Kirin's armor. Kirin blasts her in the face, and she loses an arm because Katso's stagger didn't last long enough. Kirin's armor seems thickest around the waist, so they determine that that must be where all its important parts are. The only question is, how will they pry this thing open? Back with Rakuro, he has finally gotten the hang of the head parry slash combo. Rakuro taunts Weatherman and continues laughing like a psycho. He knew that his new moon blades would be a perfect match for his skills. He has a skill that can only activate when his HP falls below one third, and it's called Climax Boost. For five minutes, it boosts his stats in proportion to the level gap between him and his enemy. Normally, activating this ability against Weatherman would be impossible since he has so little HP to begin with, and Weatherman's attacks are too powerful. He wouldn't be able to measure them out to only get his HP down to one third. However, with the Moonblade's ability to shave down and recover his HP with every attack, Rakuro is able to do it. On top of that, Rakuro uses an ability called Hunger Wolf. It only lasts for one minute, but in exchange for depleting his stamina, it increases his strength, agility, and vitality. This ability is pretty great, since the stat increase is in proportion to how few HP he has and his hunger level. SLF has a gauge to measure a player's hunger, and it fills up every time they eat. If a player goes hungry for too long, it impacts their stamina recovery rate. Rakuro micromanaged that just like everything else because he is a true gamer and he is now at the perfect level of hunger. If he can combine these skills just right, Rakuro is certain that he can win this fight. Rakuro sees another wind slash coming, so he prepares to parry it, but the slash never comes. Weatherman barely moves and oddly stares at the necklace Emo gave Rakuro. Weatherman repeats the name Alice over and over again and says ID key fragment. Rakuro realizes that this isn't some incantation and Weatherman is just talking. Rakuro thought he was just a corpse animated by machinery but now thinks Weatherman might be something more. Rakuro can't believe that the game is giving him story stuff at a time like this but Weatherman is ready to do battle again. Rakuro has every neuron in his body focused on beating this guy and refuses to let anything distract him. Weatherman won't let anyone infringe on some vow he has and uses something called Clear Sky Conquest. Rakuro sees that he is finally getting serious, but our boy is crazy and ready for anything. Rakuro mocks him for just using another wind slash, but he is shocked when there isn't even another second before the next attack. Rakuro gets concerned as Weatherman is chaining attacks now with basically no time lag between them. Rakuro manages to stop Weatherman's tidal rush, but several attacks follow after it. It's clear that Weatherman can spam attacks without recast time, so Rakuro thinks that feels like some pretty broken game balance. Weatherman breaks out a new move, which Rakuro dodges, but it's not over. Black clouds form, and Weatherman uses his Ash Blizzard attack. This is some kind of combined attack, and Rakuro does his best to avoid all the fire serpents. He is running out of stamina and dodge skills, and realizes that things will get real bad for him if the chain attack barrage continues. Rakuro doesn't lose any confidence though, and declares that it will take much more than that to take him down. Rakuro even has a few ideas up his sleeve, but Weatherman uses Clear Sky Conquest. Rakuro can't help but realize how fast Weatherman is, as he's already running as fast as he can. Just then, Rakuro's legs are trapped, and he notices that this attack Weatherman has started isn't like any of his others. He decides to take it head on, and prepares to parry the attack with his helmet. Weatherman uses his Sky Clear attack, and absolutely slices right through our boy Rakuro. Rakuro can't even understand what just happened, but he knows that the attack Weatherman just used is a nasty one. Katso prepares to revive him, but Pentagon stops him. Rakuro isn't finished just yet, and reminds Weatherman about what he told him earlier. He reiterates that it will take much more than that to take him down, and we see a rebirth jewel floating above him. A look at Emo shows that she is very concerned. Rakuro hasn't returned home yet, which means that he must still be fighting. Back at the fight, the orb falls right onto Rakuro, bringing him back to life, and he declares that this is his ultimate technique. He calls it the self-revive. It was a huge gamble, but Rakuro managed to time it just right to revive himself. Rakuro's helmet is pretty messed up though, so he determines that Weatherman's clear sky attack must have equipment destroying effects. 
Weathermon explains that he cannot be defeated unless Rekuro surpasses his ultimate, the Clear Sky Conquest. Rekuro gets concerned when Weathermon gets in his stance again, and he uses Thunderclap to begin spamming attacks like before. Weathermon is relentless with his attack as he combines the spam with some wind slashes. After just barely managing to survive, Rekuro realizes something. The chain of attacks and the final sky clear move all together make up Weathermon's clear sky conquest technique. Rekuro tries to think about how to overcome the technique and reminds himself that last time it took about 30 seconds before the sky clear hit him. Weathermon uses his fire attack but there's a lag time before it activates so that one is not a huge threat. The same goes for the Ash Blizzard, as Rekuro can easily dodge it when he can see it coming. Rekuro then dodges Weathermon's Tidal Rush, and he begins to wonder if the moves Weathermon uses in Sky Clear Conquest are chosen at random. Even if that is the case, Rekuro determines that dodging them is really just a game of memorization. Rekuro decides that the best strategy against all the powerful moves is to preserve stamina and keep it 3 meters distance at all times. He needs to keep his movements to a bare minimum, and things stop being scary when he gets used to all the attacks. However, just then, Weathermon traps Rekuro's leg again. This means trouble so he launches the resurrection item in the air. Rekuro points out that this part is the real challenge of this fight, and Weathermon uses Sky Clear to kill him again. This death feels different than all the other times, as this is an instant kill attack, meant to slaughter the player without them having a say at all. Rekuro revives himself again, and determines that even a buffed out max level player with a powerful shield would easily get split in half by Weathermon. The worst part of all is that Weathermon keeps the player from dodging, because once their legs are rooted, they have no choice but to take the sky clear attack. Rekuro's only solution for this so far has been to use his self revive technique, but he won't be able to do that for long. Rekuro considers trying to destroy Weathermon's sword, but that's not realistic, considering how he must dodge the chain attacks. Rekuro revives himself again, but realizes that that was his last rebirth tear jewel. All he has left are 5 divine life salves. Weathermon's sky clear comes every 30 seconds, so that means Rekuro has 3 minutes left to live. It's been less than 3 minutes since phase 3 started, so Rekuro determines that there's no way he's going to make it to 10 minutes. Weathermon once again declares that Rekuro must surpass his ultimate to defeat him, and Rekuro goes in for an attack. Rekuro then reminds himself that surviving 10 minutes was just a theory. Rekuro dies to another sky clear attack, and he determines that solving the sky clear must be the real victory condition against Weathermon. Rekuro's plan is to use a parry, but that will be very difficult. He needs to deflect the attack with perfect timing, and will have no choice but to do it while being rooted to one spot. If his timing is off by even just one millisecond, Weathermon will destroy his weapon, but this is the only way to win. Rekuro takes a look at all the cooldowns for his abilities, and determines that his only job right now is to work out what he needs in that one final moment. He needs to make sure he has them at his disposal during that one parry, and he takes a look at his health bar. He needs to time everything perfectly, so it will just take a little while longer before it's all ready. Back with the others, they still need to find a way to get to Kirin's vitals, and Katzel tells Pencilgon not to underestimate a pro gamer like himself. Pencilgon tells him to get to work, and shockingly ends her own life. Katzel is of course confused, and the robot keeps him from reviving her. He eventually does, and Pencilgon explains her crazy decision by pointing out that a spear wielder like herself couldn't fight with just one hand. Resurrection brought her back with a brand new hand, so it's time to get back to work. The two work together to keep the machine still, and Katzel points out that he drugged himself to get huge buffs thanks to Pencilgon. He can use two whips now, and uses them to throw the robot off balance the second it lifts its foot. Katzel explains that a pro gamer must know how the human body moves, but Pencilgon reminds him that their opponent isn't a human. Katzel gets even crazier as he breaks out every whip he has, and keeps the robot pinned to the ground. Adding armor piercing buffs to weapons makes them break faster, so Pencilgon must change hers out. Pencilgon has attacked every part of this thing's body, and it's all pretty tough. However, one spot is stronger than all the others. This part is the waste, which confirms that this must be where it's protecting its vitals. Katzo lifts the monster, and Pencilgon begins attacking its waist. Her weapon is getting close to breaking though, and Katzo's buffs are about to run out. Pencilgon's persistence pays off as she manages to break the armor, but a power surges from that part of its body. 
Pentagon's weapon is destroyed, and all of Katzel's whips are broken. Breaking the waste armor seems to have set off its berserk mode, and Pentagon determines that they have to attack it instead of just running away. If they just let it rampage, then one of its attacks might hit Rakuro. Kato imagines how Rakuro would taunt them if that happened. Rakuro would point out that he was busy fighting the boss, and they couldn't even handle distracting its pet horse. It's time for them to end the giant, but Pentagon only has two spears left. The two dodge all of the horse robot's attacks, and Pentagon begins an incantation. She takes to the sky and uses her shadow edge technique. It's a spell that lets her seal a target in place by stabbing her weapon into its shadow. It only lasts until her weapon breaks, which she determines will only be 5 seconds from now. Pentagon uses this time to bust out her giant killing skewer, but Katzo notices that the tricky robot launched the missile just before it got locked down. This missile strikes Pentagon, but Katzo is stunned when he sees that she is still alive. Pentagon takes back what she said about spear wielders not being able to fight with one arm, and she single handedly launches her spear at Kirin. She hits her target perfectly, but it's an all or nothing move as her seal wears off. It's Katzo's turn now, so he combines his red, blue, and yellow fists. He calls this his spirit fist, and he uses it to send Pentagon's spear right through Kirin. The attack is incredibly powerful, but the defeated Kirin falls right on top of Katzo. Pentagon rushes to his side and finds that he is just fine. The two are victorious, but they are also completely exhausted. Pentagon points out that Katsu is completely out of stamina, and she remembers that Rakuro is still fighting. Rakuro revives himself once more, but he just used his last resurrection item. That's okay though since he finally has everything he needs to win. The recast time of Hungry Wolf and Climax boost are over, and the fusion gauge of his Moon Blades is filled up. Weatherman begins his clear sky conquest again, so Rikuro has 30 seconds before the next sky clear attack. His helmet is useless now, so Rikuro goes back to his iconic bird mask. Rikuro begins dodging the barrage of abilities just like all the other times, and eventually there are only 2 seconds left before the sky clear attack. The key to beating it will be his moon blades, so Rikuro fuses them for the first time. This is the twin moon, and it has a special effect. The lower Rakuro's stats are relative to his enemy, the greater the power and likelihood of Rakuro's criticals. It's the perfect weapon for this moment, since it raises the likelihood that his parry will work. Combined with the stacked effects of his climax boost and hunger wolf, Rakuro is certain that he can block the sky clear. Rakuro gets ready, but he's shocked to see a notification that says his climax boost cannot be activated. This is the skill he can only use when his HP is below one third of its total value, so Rakuro just now realizes that he messed up. He worked so hard to time everything perfectly, but he didn't get his HP low enough. Hunger Wolf alone won't allow him to match Weatherman's attack speed, so he is doomed. Rakuro desperately tries to think of a solution, but he is stunned when a dagger strikes Weatherman. It came from Pentagon, who we now see is with Setsuna. They seem to have gotten Weatherman's attention, but they are shocked when Rakuro stabs himself. Rikuro explains that SLF's major update that just came out today changed the activation conditions for the luck based endure status. If a player's luck stat is over 50 and their HP reaches 0 due to self inflicted damage, then just once they can survive with a single HP. Rikuro's relentless studying of the update has paid off as he can now use both his Hunger Wolf and Climax Boost abilities. Rikuro's body erupts with insane amounts of power and he prepares for Weathermon's Sky Clear. Weatherman has said over and over how he will never give up, but Rakuro declares that he will finally put him down. Weatherman unleashes his sky clear attack, and Rakuro perfectly times an attack called Crescent Vorpal. Their attacks collide in a grand display of power, and Rakuro pushes just hard enough to dislodge Weatherman's weapon. Weatherman's armor is shattered as well, and Rakuro states that he has seen enough of Weatherman's attacks for an entire lifetime. Everyone is stunned to see that Rakuro actually did it, and he declares that Weatherman's ultimate strike has finally been solved. Weatherman's sword is destroyed, and his body slowly falls apart. Weatherman acknowledges that Rakuro has broken through his ultimate strike, and he calls him brilliant. Weatherman admires Rakuro's transformative talent, and compares it to the clearness of a cloudless sky. Weatherman calmly retrieves his sword, so Rakuro prepares himself. Weatherman makes his approach, so the others wonder if the fight really isn't over, but Pencilgon can tell that he is at his limit. Weatherman just walks past our bird-faced hero, so Rakuro realizes that the fight is finally over. 
Weatherman makes his way to Satsuna's grave and his body begins to fail. He declares that it's time for him to sleep now and his final words state that he will be with Satsuna soon. Weatherman's body falls apart and our group just watches as all that is left is his sword. They wonder if it's really over, but Pentagon checks to find that they still haven't met the clear conditions yet for the battle. The cherry tree surprisingly begins to die, and the area begins to go back to normal. Once it finishes, Pentagon is shocked to find Satsuna standing there. She speaks to our heroes and thanks them for putting Weatherman to rest. Satsuna states that the wish for her old self has finally been granted. The others wonder if this means that she isn't the real Satsuna, so she reveals that she is just a remnant of her. The real Setsuna's final wish was that Weatherman would be freed after being tied down by her death. This remnant they see now was just a product of those feelings. This being the case, she is meant to disappear once her role is fulfilled. This upsets Pencilgon greatly, but Setsuna tells her not to worry. This was always going to happen once the world granted her wish. She calls our heroes pioneers and reveals that if they want to know the truth of this world, they need to seek out Bahamut. Rikuro explains that Bahamut is basically a big fish that people treat like a dragon. Katso is quick to point out that he is not an idiot and knows what Bahamut is, but what he doesn't know is what it means in the context of this game. Pencilgon is certain that there is no monster called Bahamut in SLF and would like to know more. Unfortunately, Setsuna isn't just going to give them all the answers, as she believes that this is something they need to find the answer to on their own. This remnant decides to speak as herself instead of Setsuna and says goodbye to Pencilgon. Pencilgon is then shocked to hear that this remnant loved her, and she says goodbye back. Pencilgon quickly tells the others that she isn't crying, but Rikuro points out that he hasn't even said anything yet. The boys mock her as she is clearly tearing up, and Rikuro even says that he's surprised to see that she had tear ducts installed in her emotionless and robotic body. Pencilgon snaps back to her old self to threaten their lives, but Katsu has been through a lot and tells Rikuro to take one for the team. Just then, they all receive a message stating that they have cleared the unique scenario. This is a great achievement, so Pencilgon thanks the guys for their help. This is the first victory against a unique monster since Stronger La Frontier was created, so Rikuro can't wait to see what kind of loot they get as a reward. They all prepare to have a loot review, but they are interrupted by an announcement to all players. Everyone in the entire game listens in amazement as the announcement declares that the unique monster, Weatherman the Tomb Guard, has been defeated. The announcement doesn't end there though, as it reveals the players who defeated him, Pentagon, Katsuo, and Sunraku. As if that weren't enough, the announcement declares that with the defeat of Weatherman, the world story of Shangri-La Frontier has officially progressed. At the game's headquarters, we get a look at how much progress the players have made in the world story, and the defeat of Weatherman only moves it from 11% to 12%. In some library somewhere in Shangri-La Frontier, a group of people become frantic after hearing the news. They are sure that their professor will be logging in soon, since the defeat of a unique monster is a huge deal. These nerds know a lot, but they have never heard of the term world story before. However, they determine that it must be different from the game's regular story. The regular story involves working with NPCs to explore the world, so they assume that the world story must mean that the world itself is proceeding to a new stage. Some big changes to the game could be in store, so they want to learn as much as they can about what happened. They will start by learning about Weatherman, since there was no confirmed evidence that he even really existed until now. They now know of five unique monsters, which means that there are only two unknowns left. Their next course of action now is to get into contact with the players that defeated Weatherman. This group isn't the only one interested in our heroes, as the Schwartz clan is upset that they were the first group to defeat a unique monster. Ray's sister, Sagar 100, is their leader, and she is ashamed that they consider themselves a top clan. One little nerd points out how strange it was not to see Pentagon during the raid of Ashura Kai, and realizes now that it was because she was off slaying a unique monster. Sagar 100 determines that Pentagon was the one that leaked the information on Ashura Kai's hideout. She just used everyone to create a distraction so she could go after the unique monster. This is incredibly frustrating, and they determine that she is even more troublesome than Norselot, who managed to get away. As for Pencilgon's partners, they have never heard of Katso. Sunraku, on the other hand, is well known for being the player that fought against Lycagon. Rei is there as well, and she wonders just how close Rikuro and Pencilgon are. This clan has a big mission to go on, but Sagar 100 has decided to stay with a few other members. Sunraku was a beginner who was last seen in 3rd Rima, so it's surprising to hear that he did the unthinkable and beat a unique monster. 
Siger 100 has become incredibly interested in him and declares that she will have to find him. Just then, they notice that Siger 0 is missing and Siger 100 remembers that her sister befriended a boy she liked. Back with our heroes, they come out of the cave to find a very angry Orcelot waiting for them. The boys mock this guy and call him Orcelot the Failhard. Pentagon pours it on as well as she points out her little brother isn't even worthy of that nickname. Orcelot knows that Pencilgum was the one that leaked their info and she points out that she had no other choice. Orcelot became a chicken that was too afraid to make any moves in fear of losing it all. Orcelot refuses to accept that and prepares to attack them as he is sure that they are tired from fighting Weathermon. He plans to eliminate them and take all the loot they received from their battle but they are shocked by some magic circles. This is an anti-PK or distress signal that our group was prepared with. When attacked by a PKer, a player can send a call for help from their friends. If this player has the friend warp skill, then they can be summoned on the spot. The friend they have summoned is shockingly Siger Zero. She gives the Ashurakai one last chance to run away, but Rasalat demands that they start showing him some respect. He plans to get this respect with the fight, but the Ashurakai are taken out in 50 seconds. Orcelot is furious to see everything he worked so hard for get destroyed, but Pencilgon just ends his life. Rekuro recommends he play Feria Chronicle Online instead, but Castle calls him a monster for recommending that trash game. Pencilgon is amazed when they receive all the goods that Shurikai was carrying, since it seems like they were trying to skip town with it all. Rekuro thanks Siger Zero for helping, and she congratulates him on their victory. Rekuro remembers that the announcement was made and realizes that this will make it much harder for him not to get recognized in public. What's more concerning though is what to do with Siger Zero. He called her all the way out there so he doesn't think he can just send her off now. He just stares at her awkwardly for now but Ray couldn't be happier. Pentagon never allows for a dull moment as she surprisingly asks Siger Zero to kill her. She offers everything she has as payment but her friends are concerned. Pencilgon dying as the PKer she is will activate the PKK penalty, which means she will have to pay a fine in proportion to her crimes. Rekuro knows Pencilgon well and predicts that it will be a huge fee. Pencilgon is willing to take that risk since she has gotten tired of being a PKer and wants to wipe her slate clean. Pencilgon is still a PKer for now though and declares that she won't go down easily. She has always wanted to go all out against the Battlemaster and demands that they fight. Siger Zero takes one look at Rekuro and accepts the challenge. She pulls out the infamous unique sword of the attack master and uses its skill called Reversal. Siger Zero knows that Pencilgon is called the Giant Killer, so she has decided to give this fight everything she's got. Rekuro goes into his announcer mode and points out how Siger Zero just used a bunch of buffs on herself. Pencilgon pulls out a creepy weapon of her own while buffing herself as well and the battle begins. Rekuro couldn't be more excited and Katzel wonders how he can still have so much energy. Pencilgon's first attack is blocked and she is shocked to find that her sword is stuck. Siger Zero lands a direct hit but Pencilgon reappears from the smoke to take her arm and sword back. She makes it even more clear that this is an all out fight and attacks with her arm sword. Siger Zero gets the message loud and clear and prepares a powerful attack. After a long incantation she releases her chaos void attack causing massive destruction. Rekuro and Katso watch in amazement as Siger Zero just absolutely destroyed Pencilgon. They pick up all the items scattered everywhere and allow Siger Zero to help herself. Things get a bit awkward since Pencilgon was the smooth talker of the bunch and Rekuro doesn't know what to say. Katso wants him to say something since the two of them are friends but Rekuro points out that Siger Zero kind of forced them into a friend request. Castle decides that it's time to show off the social skills of a professional gamer, but Siger Zero steps up to ask Rekuro a question. She wants to know what kind of relationship he has with Pencilgon, and he replies that they are just gaming buddies. The friendship warp timer is up, so Rekuro says goodbye. Siger Zero tries to invite him to go adventuring, but it's too late and she's gone. Castle wonders if they should play a dating sim to improve their social skills, but Rekuro has too much trauma from his last dating sim. The last item left is Pencilgon's sword. It's pretty creepy but Rekuro decides to hang on to it anyway. The guys are more exhausted than they have ever been so they decide to head back to 3rd Rima. In 3rd Rima Rekuro accidentally scares Emil and tells her that he beat the bad guy without needing any respawns. Emil rushes to embrace him and she sobs that she was really worried about him. Rekuro returns the necklace she gave him and credits her for being the reason he was able to beat Weathermon. Emil's just relieved to see him back safe and she embraces him again. 
At the headquarters of Utopia, the developer behind Shangri-La Frontier, we find some really serious guy named Sakai. He is the head of PR, and he is told that Weatherman the Tomb Guard has been defeated. The unexpected timing has the entire company in a panic, since they thought the unique monsters would be defeated in a different order. Some other unique monster named Tarnid was expected to be defeated first, with Weatherman falling somewhere in the middle, or maybe even at the end. Sakai was hoping to enjoy his wife's cooking for the first time in three days, but instead he is dragged back into the office. This dude is stressed out, but things get even worse when he finds that he is out of digestive medicine. Up above, we find Amachi, the executive producer of the game. As if she wasn't angry enough, she gets even more annoyed by the security sequence to open the door. The retinal scan pushes her over the edge, so she screams at the machine, and it eventually opens. Inside, she speaks with Sakuri, Utopia's founder. According to Amachi, Sakuri told everyone that it would take at least 10 years for someone to beat Weatherman. Sakuri corrects her and points out that she said a Shurikai wouldn't be able to beat him. Amachi explains how unexpected it was for players to use the scales against Weatherman. They fought fair and square without any glitches, so she doesn't think there's much to complain about. Sakuri, though, has plenty to complain about as she points out that it was Amachi's decision to nerf Weatherman. The two then argue a bit about who's at fault. Sakuri thinks that Amachi cares too much about game balance and it's ruining her carefully designed story concepts. She calls Amachi a parasite, but Amachi reminds her that the game would be completely unbalanced if it wasn't for her. Sakai walks in on them and his stomach causes him excruciating pain. He tries to stop the fight, but this just ends up hurting him even more. Shangri-La Frontier is the Utopia Company's crown jewel. Sakuri designed the world, and Amichi balanced it. They are the core development staff, and he's disappointed to see that they are fighting like children. Sakai already has a lot to worry about, but he realizes that he's the only one that can fix this situation. Sakai's brilliant idea is to tell them that they both need to take a shower since it's been so long, but of course this just leads to more pain for him. Back home, our boy Rikuro gets some much needed sleep. Rei on the other hand is at her house, but she can't sleep. In her mind, Rikuro was excited to call her to his side and then let her have Pentagon stuff. Her plan is to keep getting closer to him in the game in the hopes that it might make them closer in real life. The next morning, Rikuro's eager to see what he gained from all his hard work and heads right back into the game. Rikuro arrives to find that Emil never stopped crying and she explains that her father wants to see him. Vash is glad to hear that Weatherman was incredibly powerful and the dumb wood mage Rikuro fought before couldn't even compare. Rikuro credits the victory to his experience with trash games since it taught him how to deal with unreasonable attacks. Vash is then even happier to hear that Weatherman parted this world satisfied. Rikuro is shocked when Vash decides that it might be time for something. Rikuro has no clue what he's talking about, so Vash asks him if he would like to know the truth of this world. Rikuro would be honored, so Vash tells him that he needs him to bring a few items. Rikuro is disappointed since he got all hyped up about kicking off his bonus unique scenario, but it seems to just be some fetch quest. He decides to do it anyway, and just hopes that it gets better. Rikuro receives the list of items, but he has no clue where to find them. Vash explains that he needs to go to a place called Lightless Barrens. It's nowhere near 3rd Rima, and Vash reveals that he won't find it anywhere on his map. Rikuro decides to ask Pete for help, but still wants some more info from Vash. Vash simply states that as long as Rikuro's not too much of a fool, he will find it soon enough. Unique scenarios seem to be like endgame content, so Rikuro wonders if this lightless Baron's place is somewhere way ahead of where he is now. Emil expects it to be a long journey, but our confident protagonist calls her naive. Rikuro checks his stats and is pleasantly surprised to see that he jumped all the way up to level 78. It's all thanks to the Weathermom fight, as he is now flooded with new skills and evolved ones too. He is sure that a power boost like this one will have him flying through the game for a while. That isn't all though, as our boy is excited to check what kind of loot he got from the fight. He is sure that all his effort will pay off, but he is confused by the first thing he got. It's a book titled The Tomb of Truth, and it's just a detailed rundown of Weathermom's backstory. The next item is the Clear Sky skill book, and it contains a digital record of sword techniques left by the Divinity Era Swords Master. Rikuro remembers the name Clear Sky, and is shocked when he realizes that it's talking about the powerful array of skills Weatherman used. Rikuro can't contain his excitement, as he explains to Emil that he will be able to learn the most powerful attacks he has ever seen. 
He needs to have divinity equipment in order to learn them, so it might be a while, but Rikuro doesn't care. He was hoping that Emo would share his excitement, but she's out cold from when he shared his enthusiasm. Rikuro can't wait to see what the last piece of loot is, and he finds that it's an accessory. It's the Inventoria Key, which is a special bracelet worn only by a select few, even during the Divinity. It serves as both the door and the key to a storage space. Even if the wearer is killed, neither the accessory nor the items inside the storage space can be stolen. This thing also synchronizes with the anatomical data to fuse and become part of the user. All in all, it acts as a warehouse with infinite storage space. Lastly, Rikuro can spend some MP to transport himself into the storage. That is all pretty good stuff, but it's not as impressive as the skill book. Rikuro tries it on, and Emil is shocked to see him disappear. Inside the storage, Rikuro wasn't expecting much, but he is absolutely stunned when he finds that it already has a bunch of crazy stuff in it. It turns out that this item is a lot more than he could have ever hoped for, as all this stuff is high-level equipment. Elsewhere, Pentagon leaves some flowers for Setsuna. Setsuna always called herself a copy, but to Pentagon, she was always the original. Pentagon then remembers how Setsuna told them to search for Bahamut to find the truth of this world. Pentagon originally planned to quit SLF after beating Weathermon, but she has changed her mind. She doesn't know anything about this Bahamut, but she declares that she will force it to tell her everything it knows. Things then get a bit ominous, as we are shown Rikuro's arch enemy, Lycagon. Sometime later, we find ourselves in Katso's room. He has a ton of VR headsets, and their number is only rivaled by the number of gaming awards Katso has received. Katso thinks about how good of a game Shangri-La Frontier is, and how he originally only meant to use it to kill some time when he wasn't doing pro gamer stuff. His opinion on it has changed dramatically though, as now he can't stand the thought of his friends enjoying the game without him. He has a big pro gaming tournament coming up though, so he can't join them. Just then, Rikuro messages him about the awesome Inventoria key he received from their fight. Kato quickly decides to abandon all his responsibilities, as he can't allow his friends to get ahead of him. Kato activates his ultimate VR gaming machine and heads into SLF. He meets with the others and Rikuro expresses how amazing all the crazy looking stuff is in his inventory. Kato saw it as well, and he is sure that the armor would make Rikuro way too overpowered. Pencilgon also checked out the inventory, and she reveals that all the armor is useless the way it is now. The boys are really disappointed, and she explains that everything in there requires a power source called a non-standard ether reactor. Unfortunately, she has never seen or even heard of this thing before, and Rikuro can't use the weapons and armor in the inventory without it. Rikuro is completely dejected after getting himself all excited, but Castle shockingly reveals that he actually has a non-standard ether reactor. Katso figures that it's because he did most of the fighting against Kirin, and reveals that he just got it as part of his loot. The only problem is that it seems to be broken, and all the blacksmiths he has to fix it had no clue what it was. Pencilgon explains that it's a divinity relic, so they will probably need a specialized blacksmith or some kind of item. She doesn't have an answer to this problem, but Rikuro's done the one to shock everyone when he reveals that he might know of a way to get it fixed. Pentagon spits her drink on Rikuro from shock again, but he realizes that she's just doing it on purpose. Rikuro wants to take it to someone, but it involves a unique scenario, so he fears that the others won't be able to come. Katso will allow him to borrow the reactor, but he has one condition. He wants to know the unlocked conditions for the unique scenario that Rikuro is hiding. Pentagon scolds him for giving this condition to his friend, but Katso points out that he hasn't been able to trigger any unique scenarios of his own. In SLF, information on unique scenarios is extremely valuable, and this is especially the case for players with exclusive access to one. That being said, most players protect their own profits and don't like sharing information easily. Kato is no exception, so it makes sense that he wants to make this trade. Rikuro explains that he wasn't given exact instructions when he unlocked the unique scenario, but he's willing to tell Kato what happened just before he did. The others are shocked since Rikuro became famous when everyone in the game wanted this information, and he is now about to tell them. Rikuro explains that at level 20 or less, he encountered Lycagon the Night Slayer. He lasted 5 minutes without taking damage, and landed around 200 critical hits with a Vorpal weapon. His friends are furious since there is no way they could simply replicate those steps, but Rikuro points out that he gave them an honest answer. Kato decides to just let him borrow the reactor, and Pencilgon asks for Rikuro to give her back the scale. 
A look into the past shows that Pencilgon gave it to him after their fight against Weathermon. Pencilgon borrowed it from an NPC organization called the Golden Scales, and it's part of one of the highest classes of items in the entire game. In theory, if a player throws in enough money into the scale, they can get stats even higher than those of a unique monster. Of course, to achieve this, a player would have to have a budget equal to that of a small country. This is the one item Pencilgon didn't want to lose because of the PKK penalty, so she did something called laundering. It's a trick used to keep items from being lost to the penalty. The penalty for PKing means that when they are killed, ownership of their items transfers to the person who killed them. On top of that, they have to pay a fee in proportion to their wrongdoing. When they are killed, even items kept in storage will be automatically seized and sold off to help pay off the fee. Protecting items from this seizure is called laundering. Kato assumes that is why, instead of putting the scale in storage, Pencilgon gave it to Rikuro just before Sagar Zero eliminated her. That isn't the case though, since the game will even search through your history to sell things off. The reason why the scale is still here is because ownership still lies with the Golden Scales organization. Rikuro points out that she didn't really launder anything, but she reveals that she was able to use the scale in a different way. Pencilgon says an incantation, and two items emerge from the scale. They are Pencilgon's loot from the Weathermon fight. One is the Tomb of Truth book, and the other is a flower pin. They all seem to have gotten slightly different things from the fight, and Rikuro thinks about his Clear Sky skill book. Pencilgon reveals that she offered the loot to the scale, which means they no longer had physical existence. They were hidden in the scale that she didn't own, so they could not be seized by the game. All she did now to retrieve the items was sacrifice 40 of her levels to the scale. It was a hefty price to pay, but it was worth it because this pin is very precious to her. That is in all though, as in order to rent out the scale, she used her main weapon as collateral. The scale's power transferred its ownership to the organization as well, so the weapon is also safe. Pentagon is a real evil mastermind, which completely contradicts what she said about wiping her slate clean of her crimes. The penalty's fee cost her a whopping 500 million, but Pentagon is oddly not too worried. Their fight against Weathermon proved that hunting unique monsters is a profitable enterprise. That being the case, Pencilgon gets to the main point of the meeting and proposes that they form a clan together. They all have an intense match of rock, paper, scissors, and Pencilgon is furious when she loses. The guys celebrate as her punishment for losing is that she must be their clan's leader. They refuse to go again, and Pencilgon realizes how foolish she was to think that she could beat their reaction speed. Her first responsibility as their leader is to pick their clan name, and she selects one that the guys are happy with. She declares that they will be wolves venturing through Shangri-La Frontier in search of unique monsters, and their name will be Wolfgang. Selecting their emblem will be the next difficult task, but the guys leave that to their fearless leader as well. Just then, one of the guys from the library walks in. He is in search of the trio that defeated Weathermon, and he even calls them all out by their names. Our heroes run away from him as fast as possible and pretend not to know who he is talking about. They end the meeting there, and Kato decides to go do some leveling since he lost so many levels from taking that pill during the fight. Pencilgon will go trade the scale back for her weapon, and Rikuro is left to handle the reactor stuff. The library kid decides to go after the one he has determined is the famous player Sunraku, but Rikuro still pretends that he doesn't know that person. The kid realizes that he is a liar, but Rikuro manages to get some distance from him. He rushes to tell Emo to open the gate, and she scolds him for being late. He apologizes to the grumpy little bunny, so she does as he says. Rikuro remembers that he was supposed to give the creepy sword back to Pencilgon, but he decides to do it later. The library kid thinks he has finally caught Sunraku, but he is shocked to see that he disappeared. In Rabatuza, Rikuro is disappointed to find that Vash is not there, and Emo hasn't even seen him since the day he spoke to Rikuro. Rikuro does the skill fusion thing again by drinking the concoction, and Elk tries to upsell him again. Rikuro points out that he's completely broke, but he thinks about how greedy this little rabbit is. Vash isn't there to fix the reactor, so Rikuro decides to try and ask Bylock. Unfortunately, Bylock cannot do it, since only an ancient craftsman can fix stuff from the divinity. Bylock is only a master craftsman, and Vash is the only person Bylock knows that can do it. The defeated Rikuro decides that he will just wait for Vash, and focus on raising his skills in the meantime. Just then, Rikuro gets an idea from this. There are no ancient craftsmen around, so Rikuro determines that they will just have to raise Bylock's master craftsman skill into an ancient craftsman one. 
Bylock points out that it won't be so easy, but Rikuro explains that Bylock will have to do it eventually. Rikuro has full confidence that she can do it, so he and Emo promise to help out. Bylock is hesitant at first, but she is inspired by Rikuro's words and declares that she will become an ancient craftsman. The group couldn't be more excited, and Rikuro announces the start of a new mission. The idea sounds great, but Rikuro quickly realizes that he has no clue how to turn Bylock into an ancient craftsman. Luckily, Bylock knows, so she explains that two things are required to become one. The first is a legacy weapon, and the other is something called Margic Opleration Zunit. This rabbit has some kind of speech impediment though, as Rikuro realizes that she means a magic operations unit. Neither of these things will be easy to find, but Rikuro realizes that a legacy weapon would have to be from the Divinity Era. Rikuro remembers that he has a bunch of Divinity stuff in his inventory, so he teleports there. Rikuro returns shortly after and shocks Bylock with a legacy weapon. Bylock can't believe Rikuro has one of these rare weapons, but Rikuro simply explains that he got it by beating Weathermon. Unfortunately, Rikuro assumes that she needs a working legacy weapon, and this weapon won't work until he gets the ether reactor fixed. Bylock reveals that she only needs a legacy weapon because it will allow her to learn the divinity techniques used to make the weapon. A working one would be ideal, but the one Rikuro brought should do just fine. Bylock then gets overly excited and reveals that all she will have to do is destroy the weapon into pieces. Rikuro urgently stops her and explains that he has to get consent from his friends before they break the weapon down. Rikuro thinks about how this weapon came from his inventory. However, Katso and Pencilgon both spoke about it like all the stuff in there would be shared between the three of them. Bylock agrees to wait for a while, but reminds him that he will have to search for the magic operations unit in the meantime. Vash once told her that this item can be found in the ruins of past glories. A look at the map reveals that this place is pretty far away as it is near the 11th city in the game. Things get even more exciting when Rikuro realizes that this is also near the Lightless Barrens. The Lightless Barrens is the place Vash told him about. The place where Rikuro will find the items he needs to unlock the bonus secret scenario. Rikuro wonders if this is fate and he gets more hyped than ever. Bylock goes to get ready and Rikuro's glad to have another bunny accompany him. However, walking around with the two of them might become a problem. Rikuro manages to hide Emo by wearing her around his neck, but Bylock might have to chug a bunch of magic power recovery items to maintain a human form. Bylock reveals some bad news as she cannot transform into a human at all, and she has a better idea anyway. Bylock gets real intense as she tells Emo to get ready and demands that Rikuro behold their power of camouflage. The two bunnies rush toward our bird hero, and Bylock makes herself look like a fur coat while Emo becomes a fashionable scarf. Rikuro looks ridiculous, but Bylock just tells the bird man to get moving. Rikuro decides to just go, but realizes that he needs to set his respawn point in Rabatuza. They begin their journey afterwards as they prepare to enter the Canyon of Ancient Souls. There was a war there a long time ago, but it had to be called off due to the arrival of monsters. The large number of dead produced by the war caused miasma to cover the land. This turned into a nesting ground for undead creatures who despise the living. It's incredibly dangerous there, as it's said to be riddled with monsters and curses. Rikuro must then tell the rabbits to quiet down. He doesn't want them drawing any attention to their group, even though their bird face and rabbit-covered body stand out a bunch already. To prepare for the canyon, Rikuro goes to buy some things to protect them from the miasma. If someone's exposed to it for too long, then they will end up with the hex status. A status that reduces all stats by a certain percentage. The holy water is quite expensive, but the bunnies are surprised to hear that he will only need to buy enough to protect them. They arrive at the canyon, and it's just like the rabbits described. The air quality is terrible, and danger can be felt everywhere. As they walk, Bylock wonders how the birdman was able to get an aura of clean air around him. Rikuro's glad she asked, and he reveals that it's because of the effect of the mark like a gun put on him. Any spell or curse from a source weaker than Legagon gets cancelled out. It's even able to cancel out the miasma, but there's more to it. Before he can explain further, some giant wyvern zombie appears. This monster takes one look at Rikuro's scars and takes off running. Rikuro explains that thanks to the marks, anything that is a lower level than him just runs away. Rikuro wishes he could test out the new skills he got, but all the monsters are terrified of him. 
Bylock realizes that the marks are telling the monsters to keep their hands off of Lycagon's prey, but she just considers the monsters to be cowards. Rakuro determines that leveling up after fighting Weathermon has made him way too overpowered since now their journey through the canyon just seems like a short stroll. Bylock wishes she could show off her skills too, but Rakuro wonders if she can even fight. Bylock gets offended, but her chance to fight might come sooner than expected as another undead monster appears. It's not running away from Rakuro, so Emo determines that it must be strong. Rakuro points out that it might just not be able to see him, since the thing doesn't even have a head. This monster is actually a rare beast called the Dullahan General. Rakuro wonders if it just wants to talk, but the bunnies point out that it doesn't even have a mouth. The monster makes it clear that it wants to fight, so our heroes get ready. The monster initiates the fight, so Rakuro uses ignition on himself and prepares to use his new skills. Rakuro dodges the thing's first attack, but he must tell Emo to be careful and tuck her ears in. The two then battle it out, but Rakuro can tell that this thing is really strong. It's definitely a higher level than him, but Rakuro somehow doesn't feel threatened at all. He doesn't know why, but he determines that it must be because he just fought one of the most powerful warriors he has ever encountered. Rakuro decides that he will have to get his opponent off his horse first, so he uses his Vorpal Blade technique. This move knocks the horse off balance, knocking the monster off of it, and Balak moves in for her turn. She is sure that the undead body will be light, and she sends the thing flying with her megaton swing. The undead body gets some serious hang time, but Rakuro refuses to let Bylock show them up. He has Emil prepare a spell, and he combines some of his abilities to go airborne as well. Rakuro takes one look at Bylock though, and she signals to him that she wants to handle this undead on her own. Taking a backseat to an NPC is something a trash gamer must know when to do, so he decides that he will let the tough little bunny land the finishing blow. For now though, Rakuro's ignition skill is ready, and his luck stat is finally in the triple digits. Rakuro uses his luck based attack skill called Hand of Fortune, and he sends the undead flying towards the ground. Rakuro then equips Emil onto his arm, and makes up a skill called Rabbit Gun. Emil activates her spell, and sends their opponent directly towards Bylock. Bylock prepares her giant hammer, and absolutely rocks the undead monster. It goes crashing into the horse, and Rakuro is amazed by the destruction the little rabbit was able to cause. Their opponent is defeated, and Rakuro gets the general's decapitator as his reward. The thing looks pretty beat up, but when used, attacks to the head deals bonus damage. It has gotten pretty rusty though, so it can only cleave flesh through brute force. The lore behind the monster reveals that it lost its head, so that is why it aims for the heads of its targets. Rikuro determines that he will just sell the weapon, but Bala can tell that it still has some life in it. She would like for Rikuro to keep it, as she plans to restore it to its former glory. Rikuro agrees as he remembers that she is a blacksmith. He then casually takes a look at Bylock's stats, and is shocked to find that she's an incredible level 98. Rakuro is a bit disheartened because he only just recently managed to pass Emil in level. Bylock makes him feel better though, as she explains that she got all her experience from smithing, and Rakuro got his from fighting. Rakuro and Emil impart some wisdom onto Bylock, but Bylock is not amused to see that Emil is starting to take after the Birdman. Rakuro declares that they have to get moving again, as they have to hurry and reach the area boss. Rakuro thinks that the route is pretty simple compared to others, and Emil agrees but we see that something is following them. After a while, the bunnies get a little too comfortable since the marks on Rakuro's body are making their journey far too easy. It's clearing up the miasma and pushing back all the monsters. The bunnies go too far, so Rakuro must demand that they get off his back and walk on their own. They point out to the mobile air purifier that staying near him helps preserve holy water, so he decides to just move forward. Rakuro wonders if just climbing over everything would make the trip faster, but Emo warns that there are terrifying monsters up there. They are called crystal scorpions, and they lurk atop the cliffs. They attack as a swarm, so whoever gets spotted by one is sure to end up dead. Just then, Rakuro thinks that he saw something, and the rabbits fear that it might have been one of the scorpions. This is especially terrifying, since the sight of one means that dozens more are on their way. They have to get moving as Balak reminds Rakuro that their goal is to fight the area boss, but our crazy protagonist thinks about picking a fight with one of these scorpions later. The rabbits point out how insane that idea is, but the birdman just lets out a laugh. Rakuro strikes fear into the heart of some monsters, and they eventually find a large black dome of darkness. 
Rikuro assumes that the boss is inside of it, so he fearlessly plunges in. It's pretty creepy inside this dome, as Emil freaks out, but they eventually find what they were after. It's the area boss called the Humming Lich. Rikuro assumes that this skeleton monster likes to throw curses around, so he decides that they need to strike first before it does. The bunnies try to stop him for a moment, but it's too late. Rikuro is shocked when his blade goes right through the monster, and he realizes that it doesn't have a hitbox. This is what Bylock was trying to tell him, and she reveals that he would need a holy attribute weapon to deal physical damage to it. Rikuro points out that he doesn't have one of those, and they get covered in the monster's miasma. Rikuro even takes some damage from it, and Bylock points out that this monster is the source of all the miasma in the entire area. Rikuro's being hit by all the hatred and death around them, so it's way more potent than an ordinary miasma. Luckily, the debuff from Rikuro's mark kicks in, and their surrounding area clears up. This means that neither side is hurt by the other's attacks, and this fight is at a stalemate. Bylock decides that she will have to take the lead on this one. She tells Rikuro to buy her some time, as she plans to figure out a solution. Rikuro starts off the time buying immediately, but Ima wonders why he attached her to his arm. He points out that she is the only one that can actually attack the boss, so he plans to use her as his rabbit gun again. Emo thinks it's a terrible idea, but he promises to get her some carrots later. Emo gets herself ready by putting on her tiny monocle, and she unleashes a powerful magic attack. The attack seems to have done some damage, but not much, so Rikuro wonders how much longer Bylock needs. Bylock explains that what she is doing is extremely difficult, as she plans to turn the rusty sword from before into a weapon that can hurt the lich. It's going to be a rush job, but she assures the sword that it still has some life left in it. Emil freaks out as arms emerge from the ground, but Rikuro points out that it's light work compared to what he went through against Weathermon. They get away and land another magic attack, but the monster gets really upset and grows a bunch of heads. These heads grow into identical liches, and each one of them holds a different weapon. Rikuro does his best to dodge all their attacks, but it starts to get pretty annoying. They end up in a pretty bad spot, but luckily Bylock has just finished the sword. Just the liquid coming off the sword is enough to harm one of the liches, so Rikuro commends Bylock for really cleaning up the rusty old blade. Bylock didn't have a forge to use, so it's not her best work, but she managed to polish the sword with holy water. It will be able to slice right through the liches, but it has also gotten way more fragile. At most, it has 8 more swings before it breaks, so Rikuro must somehow end the fight before then. This will be very difficult since there are so many liches, but our boy Rikuro is up for the challenge. Just then, the liches start humming, and they begin their attack. Rikuro gets away with the bunnies, and realizes that he needs to learn a bit about the clones before he attacks. Rikuro reaches into his bag of skills, and uses them to dodge several attacks. He manages to get one of the clones to attack a different one, and he notices that the main lich takes damage. The main lich wasn't the one that got hit with the arrow though, so this makes Rikuro realize that the original and the clones all share an HP pool. The original reacted pretty harshly to the attack, so Rikuro determines that its HP must be pretty low. He tells the rabbits his plan, but Bylock thinks he's crazy. He manages to convince the cautious furball, so he launches Bylock into the sky. He follows soon after, and declares that it's time to use some buffs. His buff skill can only be used after 10 minutes have passed since the start of the battle, and that just so happens to be right now. Rikuro uses the skill called Overheat, and it buffs all his stats for 5 minutes. He combines this with Nitro Gain, which buffs his strength and agility, in exchange for 20% of his HP. This leaves him with 4 health points, which means he will be able to use Climax Boost. Emo clears a path for him, and Rikuro starts off his strategy by taking out the archer. Attacks to the head do extra damage, which in combination with all his buffs, allow him to eliminate each clone with just one strike. Five clones remain along with the original, but Rikuro only has seven attacks left. That isn't the only concern, since the overheat buff ends in five minutes, and his stats will go way down when it does. Emo lands an attack, and Rikuro is able to follow up by eliminating the axe-wielding clone. Rikuro realizes that he won't be able to defeat them with one strike after the five minutes are up, so he will have to end the fight before then. Bylock is amazed as she watches Rikuro fight, and she realizes that this is why he was able to defeat a Colossus. 
Bylock decides to trust his plan, and Mercuro finishes up all the clones. The main body remains, but he only has two attacks left. Rikuro tells Emo to get to work as he tosses her into the sky, but she has no clue what she's supposed to do. Emo uses a magic attack to startle the Lich, and this gives Rikuro the perfect opportunity to stab it with his sword. They all commend the sword for holding on for this long, but they just need it to last for a bit longer. Rikuro tells Bylock that it's time to end the fight, and he carries her right to the Lich. Bylock puts all her strength into her hammer, and uses it to push the sword right through the Lich. Our heroes are victorious, and Nemo nearly ends Rikuro's life by accident. Bylock thinks she might still be able to restore the sword, but they need to hurry up and get to 8 Hold City. Rikuro checks his loot first, but it's just a bunch of stuff he can't really use. The fog clears as the boss has been defeated, but Emo reminds him not to get any crazy ideas when he clearly starts looking for scorpions to fight. When they reach the city, Rikuro registers it as a landmark. This means that he can now use Emo's gates to come and go between Rabatuza and Eightholt. Bylock would like to go back to Rabatuza to fix the sword, so Rikuro decides to split up for now to get some rest. He sends Emo back with Bylock since he wants to explore the new city. Rikuro explains that she would just make him stand out more than he already does. She doesn't believe that that's the real reason, but he convinces her again by bribing her with carrots. They split up, but Emo makes him promise that he won't do anything reckless. The Birdman promises, but as soon as she leaves, he lets out a devious laugh. She asked him not to be reckless, but it's in his nature to do things when people tell him not to do them. The lunatic heads off to look for trouble, and thinks about how this situation is similar to the story about Pandora's box. Even when you know it's going to unleash all the world's misfortunes, you just have to open it. The crazy bird thinks that this is what it means to be human. He makes sure to buy carrots for Emo, but he heads right back to the canyons of ancient souls afterwards. Rikuro prepares himself for a little climbing, and tells the scorpions to get ready for him. Rikuro boosts his leaping ability, and jumps as high as he can. He is determined to find the crystal scorpions, because he would really like to fight level 100 monsters. Rikuro knows that the bunnies don't want him doing anything dangerous, but Rikuro points out that the whole point of playing games is so he can go wild. When he reaches the top, he is shocked to find that it looks much different up here than it does below. Rikuro looks for the scorpions, and he is in luck when one of them appears behind him. He is amazed that it's the type of monster to use camouflage, and Rikuro announces that this is the monster he came to see. He must then dodge several attacks from this thing, and he compares it to a runaway train. It's pretty hard to move around on all the crystals, but the scorpion is using it to its advantage. It has driven Rikuro into a corner, but he just manages to dodge its next attack. Rikuro explains that this is just his first time fighting this thing, so he doesn't expect to beat the powerful monster in his current state. For now, he will just scout the area, and take back any rare materials he finds. He doesn't want to push for more than that, and he would actually consider it a win. Just then, the situation gets way worse for our birdface hero, as several more scorpions appear. Rikuro just now remembers that Bylock told him that the scorpions attack as a swarm, and it will all be over if he gets seen by even just one of them. Rikuro finds himself in that exact position right now, as he is surrounded by way more than just one of the powerful monsters. They attack as a group, and Rikuro concedes that he is dead. Back in Rabatuza, Emo wishes Rikuro would come back already, and she gets worried when she thinks he might have trouble getting back there. Just then, Rikuro respawns there, and he is furious about how many stupid scorpions there were. He casually requests that Emo open a gate so he can go back to Eighthold, but she is disappointed when she realizes that he was fighting crystal scorpions. She scolds him, but he just gives her a carrot to get on her good side again. Emo makes the gate, so Rikuro gets ready for round 2 against the scorpions. Emo wonders if that's a good idea, but Rikuro has already decided that he needs to get something out of the fight. He promises that he will be okay, since it won't be his first try this time, and he is determined not to leave there empty-handed. This time, Rikuro tries sneaking around, and heads to a place he thought looked interesting. He finds a giant black crystal, and Rikuro is sure that it will give him rare items that are unique to this area. Rikuro accidentally strikes another crystal which makes a lot of noise, and he once again finds himself being descended upon by the scorpions. He uses a bunch of skills, and launches himself into the sky. Rikuro refuses to leave without some loot, 
and he resorts to a desperate attempt at striking the crystal. He just ends up getting eliminated, and he responds right back in Rabbituza. Emo points out how fast that was, and he has determined that surviving against them is impossible. There are so many of them, and they attack in a place where there already isn't enough room. Emo reminds him that they warned him about all that, and Rokuro reminds her that he said something as well. He said he wouldn't leave empty handed, and the tricky bird man reveals that he managed to get part of the crystal. This thing is a lapless, and it possesses an extremely dense magic. He has no clue what it's used for, but he is sure that it's probably pretty valuable. Rokuro decides to take a break for now, and he goes over his fight against the scorpions. The slightest vibration on the crystal causes them to swarm, but he doesn't think that the AI behind them is very clever. They just charge in recklessly, and sometimes even collide with each other. Emo tries to sing him to sleep, but Rokuro thinks of something. He wonders if he can take parts of their broken off bodies as an item, and demands that Emo open a gate so he can find out. Emo warns that he's just going to die again, but he declares that pioneers like him never fear death. Rokuro wonders how he will pick up their carapace bits, and he gets an idea when he sees Emo replenishing her mana. Our confident hero then declares that he's going to change the minefield swarming with level 100 monsters into a walk in the park. Rokuro heads back where he taunts the scorpions as they chase him. Rokuro pretends to be scared as they descend upon him again, but he uses his leaping ability and watches them collide. There are carapace pieces everywhere, but there's also a ton of scorpions waiting for him to come back down. Rokuro would like to know what it would feel like to fall into the scorpion blender, but he decides against it. Instead, he teleports into Inventoria. Rokuro celebrates that his idea will work, and laughs like a maniac as he proclaims that technology is king. He got the idea to use his storage when he saw Emil using an item. This Inventoria thing is seriously overpowered if used right, since he can create a safe space for himself whenever he needs. Rokuro finds that his genius plan works when he returns to the crystal area and finds that there are only carapace pieces there. The scorpions are all gone, so it's time for Rokuro to collect his spoils. Rokuro is certain that these items are rare, and he can't wait to see what kind of awesome stuff Bala can make from it. Rokuro declares himself a genius and punches a crystal. The scorpions emerge again, but this time the bird proclaims that he's going to turn them all into materials. Rokuro rounds them up and explains what makes Inventoria even more OP. Normally, players have a hard limit on inventory capacity, and if it gets too heavy, it begins to weigh the player down. However, Inventoria lets him store as much as he wants with no penalty. If he uses it correctly, Rokuro declares that he can get unlimited materials from over level 100 crystal scorpions. He then uses this strategy over and over again, and states that coming up with stuff like this is what makes gaming so fun. He is almost out of mana, so he can only use Inventoria one more time. He has a bunch of materials already though, so he decides to just make one last run. As he marvels at all his rare stuff, Rokuro realizes that he hasn't collected a single stinger. It's the most defining feature of every scorpion, so he must get one. He determines that the stinger must be the hardest part to break off from the body, which means that it must also be the rarest drop of all. When he thinks about it though, it seems pretty impossible. To get the stinger, he will have to face the swarm of level 100 scorpions directly. On top of that, the thing he's aiming for can't be broken off with normal attacks. A scorpion appears, and Rokuro points out that this kind of impossible situation is trash game stuff. That's also what makes it fun for him though, so he summons his weapons. He declares that he will tear off its stinger no matter what, or else he wouldn't be able to consider himself a trash gamer. Rokuro begins to fight it, but quickly realizes that his attacks aren't enough to break the stinger off even when he is buffed. More scorpions appear, and Rokuro decides that he will have to somehow get them all to break the stinger off for him. Rokuro can't control their attacks, so he will have to hope to get the best possible pool out of the random number generator. It's pretty risky, but that's what being a gamer is all about. Rokuro then dodges an attack and lands on the stinger. He only has one chance at this, so he waits to the very last second. Rokuro times it perfectly, and he goes to Inventoria just as the scorpions hit the stinger. He returns immediately as their attack alone won't be enough, so he attacks the fractured stinger as well. Rokuro uses all his might, and eventually manages to break it off. 
Rekuro celebrates as all his hard work paid off. He just needs to grab the rare item now, and will be all his even if he gets insta-killed afterwards. Unfortunately, Rekuro realizes that he's much further from it than he thought. The stinger gets away from him as he begins to fall into the pit of scorpions, and he wonders why the goddess of RNG has decided to be so cruel to him. Rekuro responds in Rabatuza once again, and Emil is concerned about him as he trembles in despair. Rekuro calms down and finds solace in knowing that getting the stinger is possible. This calmness is all fake though, as Rekuro is really angry, and he declares that knowing stuff doesn't mean anything if he doesn't actually get the thing. He completely loses composure and condemns the goddess of RNG. Emil watches his descent into madness, but he is done and Rekuro decides that he won't be able to look at scorpions for a while. Emil then becomes startled when Rekuro declares that there is only one way to come back from this failure. He will brag to Bylock about all the materials he got and bathe in her praise. Emil's pretty disappointed to see him this way, but time is money so it's time for them to go. Thanks for watching my recap, sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel, link is in the description.